On hearing all this, my spiritual father said, I rejoice with all my heart, dear brother, that God has so ordered it that I should see you again, so unexpectedly and so soon. And since you now have time, I want, in all love, to keep you a little longer, and you shall tell me more about the instructive experiences you have met with in the course of your long pilgrimages. I have already listened with great pleasure and interest to what you told me before. I am quite ready and happy to do that, I answered, and I began as follows, a great many things have happened to me, some good and some bad. It would take a long while to tell of them all, and much I have already forgotten. For I have tried especially to remember only such matters as guided and urged my idle soul to prayer. All the rest I rarely remember, or rather I have tried to forget the past, as Street Paul bids us when he says, forgetting the things that are behind and stretching forward to the things that are before, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the high calling. My late starets of blessed memory also used to say that the forces which are against prayer in the heart attack us from two sides, from the left hand and from the right. That is to say, if the enemy cannot turn us from prayer by means of vain thoughts and sinful ideas, then he brings back into our minds good things we have been taught, and fills us with beautiful ideas, so that one way or another he may lure us away from prayer, which is a thing he cannot bear. It is called a theft from the right hand side, and in it the soul, putting aside its converse with God, turns to the satisfaction of converse with self or with created things. He taught me, therefore, not to admit during times of prayer even the most lofty of spiritual thoughts. And if I saw that in the course of the day, time had been spent more in improving thought and talk than in the actual hidden prayer of the heart, then I was to think of it as a loss of the sense of proportion, or a sign of spiritual greed. This is above all true, he said, in the case of beginners, for whom it is most needful that time given to prayer should be very much more than that taken up by other sides of the devout life. Still one cannot forget everything. A matter may have printed itself so deeply in one's mind that although it has not been actually thought of for a long time, yet it is remembered very clearly. A case in point is the few days stay that God deemed me worthy to enjoy with a certain devout family in the following manner. During my wanderings in the Tobolsk government, I happened to pass through a certain country town. My supply of dried bread had run very low, so I went to one of the houses to ask for some more. The householder said, Thank God, you have come just at the right moment my wife has only just taken the bread out of the oven, so there is a hot loaf for you. Remember me in your prayers. I thanked him and was putting the bread away in my knapsack when his wife, who was looking on, said, What a wretched state your knapsack is in, it is all worn out. I'll give you another instead. And she gave me a good strong one. I thanked them very heartily and went on. On leaving the town I went into a little shop to ask for a bit of salt, and the shopkeeper gave me a small bag quite full. I rejoiced in spirit and thanked God for leading me, unworthy as I was, to such kindly folk. Now, thought I, without having to worry about food I shall be filled and content for a whole week. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul! Three miles or so from this town, the road I was following passed through a poor village, where I saw a little wooden church nicely decked out and painted on the outside. As I was going by it I felt a wish to honour God's house, and going into the porch I prayed for a while. On the grass at the side of the church there were playing two little children of five or six years of age. I took them to be the parish priest's children, for they were very nicely dressed. I finished my prayers and went on my way, but I had not gone a dozen paces from the church when I heard a shout behind me. Dear little beggar! Dear little beggar! Stop! The two little ones I had seen, a boy and a girl, were calling and running after me. I stopped, and they ran up to me and took me by the hand. Come along to mommy, she likes beggars. I'm not a beggar, I told them. I'm just a passerby. Why have you got a bag, then? That is for the bread I eat on the way. All the same you must come. 
Mommy will give you some money for your journey. But where is your mommy? I asked. Down there behind the church, behind that little wood. They took me into a beautiful garden in the middle of which stood a large country house, we went inside, and how clean and smart it all was. The lady of the house came hurrying to us. Welcome, welcome. God has sent you to us, and how did you come? Sit down, sit down, dear. With her own hands she took off my knapsack and put it on a table, and made me sit in a very comfortably padded chair. Wouldn't you like something to eat? Or a cup of tea? Isn't there anything you need? I most humbly thank you, I answered, but I have a whole bag full of food. It is true that I do take tea, but as a peasant I am not very used to it. I value your heartfelt and kindly welcome even more than the treat you offer me. I shall pray that God may bless you for showing such love for strangers in the spirit of the Gospels. While I was speaking, a strong feeling came over me, urging me to withdraw within myself again. The prayer was surging up in my heart, and I needed peace and silence to give free play to this quickening flame of prayer, as well as to hide from others the outward signs which went with it, such as tears and sighs and unusual movements of the face and lips. I therefore got up, saying, Please excuse me, but I must leave now, may the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and with your dear little children. Oh, no. God forbid that you should go away. I won't allow it. My husband, who is a magistrate, will be coming back from town this evening, and how delighted he will be to see you. He reverences every pilgrim as a messenger of God. If you go away he will be really grieved not to have seen you. Besides that, tomorrow is Sunday, and you will pray with us at the liturgy, and at the dinner table take your share with us in what God has sent. On holy days we always have up to thirty guests, and all of them are poor brothers in Jesus Christ. Come now, why have you told me nothing about yourself, where you come from and where you are going? Talk to me, I like listening to the spiritual conversation of devout people. Children, children. Take the pilgrim's knapsack into the oratory, he will spend the night there. I was astonished as I listened to what she said, and I asked myself whether I was talking with a human being or with a ghost of some sort. So I stayed and waited for her husband. I gave her a short account of my travels, and said I was on my way to Irkutsk. Why, then, you will have to go through to Bolsk, said the lady, and my own mother is a nun in a convent there, she is a schemer nun now. We will give you a letter, and she will be glad to see you. A great many people go to consult her on spiritual matters. And you will be able to take her a book by Street John of the Ladder, which we have just ordered from Moscow at her request. How nicely it all fits in. Soon it was dinner time, and we sat down to table. Four other ladies came in, and began the meal with us. When the first course was ended one of them rose, bowed to the icon, and then to us. Then she went and fetched the second course and sat down again. Then another of the ladies in the same way went, and brought the third course. When I saw this, I said to my hostess, may I venture to ask whether these ladies are relations of yours? Yes, they are indeed sisters to me, this is my cook, and this the coachman's wife, that one has charge of the keys, and the other is my maid. They are all married, I have no unmarried girls at all in my whole household. The more I saw and heard of all this, the more surprised I was, and I thanked God for letting me see these devout people. I felt the prayer stirring strongly in my heart, so, wishing to be alone as soon as I could and not hinder the prayer, I said to the lady as soon as we rose from the table, no doubt you will rest for a while after dinner, and I am so used to walking that I will go for a stroll in the garden. No, I don't rest, she replied. I will come into the garden with you, and you shall talk to me about something instructive. If you go alone, the children will give you no peace, directly they see you, they will not leave you for a minute, they are so fond of beggars, and brothers in Christ, and pilgrims. 
there was nothing for me to do but to go with her. In order to avoid doing the talking myself, when we got into the garden I bowed down to the ground before her and said, Do tell me, please, have you lived this devout life long, and how did you come to take it up? I will tell you the whole story if you like, was the answer. You see, my mother was a great-granddaughter of Street Joseph, whose relics rest at Bielgorod. We had a large town house, one wing of which was rented to a man who was a gentleman but not well off. After a while he died, his wife was left pregnant and herself died in giving birth to a child. The infant was left an orphan and in poverty, and out of pity my mother adopted him. A year later I was born. We grew up together and did lessons together with the same tutors and governesses, and were as used to each other as a real brother and sister. Some while later my father died, and my mother gave up living in town and came with us to live on this estate of hers here. When we grew up, she gave me in marriage to her adopted son, settled this estate on us, and herself took the veil in a convent, where she had a cell built for her. She gave us a mother's blessing, and as her last will and testament she urged us to live as good Christians, to say our prayers fervently, and above all try to fulfill the greatest of God's commandments, that is, the love of one's neighbor, to feed and help our poor brothers in Christ in simplicity and humility, to bring up our children in the fear of the Lord, and to treat our serfs as our brothers. And that is how we have been living here by ourselves for the last ten years now, trying as best we could to carry out mother's last wishes. We have a guesthouse for beggars, and at the present moment there are living in it more than ten crippled and sick people. If you care to, we will go and see them tomorrow. When she had ended her story, I asked her where the book by Street John of the Ladder was, which she wished to send to her mother. Come indoors, she said, and I will find it for you. We had just sat down and begun to read it when her husband came in and, seeing me, gave me a warm welcome. We kissed each other as two brothers in Christ, and then he took me off to his own room, saying, Come, dear brother, let us go into my study, and you shall bless my cell. I expect she, pointing to his wife, has been boring you. No sooner does she catch sight of a pilgrim of either sex, or of some sick person, then she is so delighted that she will not leave them day or night. She has been like that for years and years we went into the study. What a lot of books there were, and beautiful icons, and the life-giving cross with the figure life-sized, and the gospels lying near it. I said a prayer. You are in God's own paradise here, I said. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and his most holy mother, and the blessed saints. And there, I went on, pointing to the books, are the divine, living, and everlasting words of their teaching. I expect you very often enjoy heavenly converse with them. Yes, I admit I am a great lover of reading, he answered. What sort of books are they you have here? I asked. I have a large number of religious books was the answer. Here you see are the lives of the saints for the whole year, and the works of Street John Chrysostom, and Basil the Great, and many other theologians and philosophers. I have a lot of volumes of sermons, too, by celebrated modern preachers. My library is worth about five hundred pounds. Haven't you anything on prayer? Yes, I am very fond of reading about prayer. Here is the very latest work on the subject, the work of a Petersburg priest. He took down a book on the Lord's Prayer and we began to read it with great enjoyment. A short while after the lady came in, bringing tea, followed by the children, who dragged in a large silver basket full of biscuits and cakes such as I had never tasted before in my life. My host took the book from me and handed it to his wife, saying, Now we will get her to read, she reads beautifully, and we will keep our strength up with the tea. So she began reading, and we listened. And as I listened I felt the action of the prayer in my heart. The longer the reading went on the more the prayer grew and made me glad. Suddenly I saw something flash quickly before my eyes, in the air as it were, like the figure of my departed starets. I started, and so as to hide the fact I said, 
excuse me, I must have dropped asleep for a moment. Then I felt as though the soul of my starets made its way into my own, or gave light to it. I felt a sort of light in my mind, and a number of ideas about prayer came to me. I was just crossing myself and setting my will to put these ideas aside when the lady came to the end of the book and her husband asked me whether I had liked it, so that talking began again. Very much, I answered, the Our Father is the loftiest and most precious of all the written prayers we Christians have, for the Lord Jesus Christ himself gave it to us. And the explanation of it which has just been read is very good, too, only it all deals for the most part with the active side of the Christian life, and in my reading of the Holy Fathers I have come across a more speculative and mystical explanation of the prayer. In which of the Fathers did you read this? Well, in Maxim the Confessor, for example, and in Peter the Damascene, in the Philokalia. Do you remember it? Tell us about it, please. Certainly. The first words of the prayer, our Father which art in heaven are explained in your book as a call to brotherly love for one's neighbor, since we are all children of the one Father, and that is very true. But in the Holy Fathers the explanation goes further and is more deeply spiritual. They say that when we use these words we should lift up our mind to heaven, to the Heavenly Father, and remember every moment that we are in the presence of God. The words Hallowed be thy name are explained in your book by the care we ought to have not to utter the name of God except with reverence, nor to use it in a false oath, in a word that the holy name of God be spoken holily and not taken in vain. But the mystical writers see here a plain call to inward prayer of the heart, that is, that the most holy name of God may be stamped inwardly upon the heart and be hallowed by self-acting prayer and hallow all our feelings and all the powers of the soul. The words Thy Kingdom come they explain thus may inward peace and quiet and spiritual joy come to our hearts. In your book again, the words give us this day our daily bread are understood as asking for what we need for our bodily life, not for more than that, but for what is needed for ourselves and for the help of our neighbor. On the other hand, Maxim the Confessor understands by daily bread the feeding of the soul with heavenly bread, that is, the Word of God and the union of the soul with God, by dwelling upon him in thought and the unceasing inward prayer of the heart. Ah, but the attainment of interior prayer is a very big business and almost impossible for lay folk, exclaimed my host. We are lucky if we manage to say our ordinary prayers without slothfulness. Don't look at it in that way, said I. If it were out of the question and quite too hard to do, God would not have bidden us all do it. His strength is made perfect in weakness. The Holy Fathers who speak from their own experience, offer us the means, and make the way to win the prayer of the heart easier. Of course, for hermits they give special and higher methods, but for those who live in the world their writings show ways which truly lead to interior prayer. I have never come across anything of that sort in my reading, he said. If you would care to hear it, may I read you a little from the Philokalia? I asked, taking up my copy. I found Peter the Damascene's article and read as follows, one must learn to call upon the name of God, more even than breathing at all times, in all places, in every kind of occupation. The Apostle says, pray without ceasing. That is, he teaches men to have the remembrance of God in all times and places and circumstances. If you are making something, you must call to mind the Creator of all things, if you see the light, remember the giver of it, if you see the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, wonder and praise the Maker of them. If you put on your clothes, recall whose gift they are and thank Him who provides for your life. In short, let every action be a cause of your remembering and praising God, and lo! You will be praying without ceasing and therein your soul will always rejoice. There, you see, this way of ceaseless prayer is simple and easy, and within the reach of everybody so long as he has some amount of human feeling. They were extraordinarily pleased with this. My host took me in his arms and thanked me again and again. Then he looked at my philokalia, saying, I must certainly buy myself a copy of this. I will get it at once from Petersburg, 
but for the moment and in memory of this occasion I will copy out the passage you have just read you read it out to me. And then and there he wrote it out beautifully. Then he exclaimed, Why, goodness me! Of course I have an icon of the Damascene. It was probably of Street John Damascene, he picked up a frame, put what he had written behind the glass, and hung it beneath the icon. There, said he, the living word of the saint underneath his picture will often remind me to put his wholesome advice into practice. After this we went to supper. As before, the whole household, men and women, sat down to table with us. How reverently silent, and calm the meal was. And at the end of it we all, the children as well, spent a long while in prayer. I was asked, to read the Akathist, to Jesus the heart's delight. Afterward the servants went away to bed, and we three were left alone in the room. Then the lady brought me a white shirt and a pair of stockings. I bowed down at her feet and said, The stockings, little mother, I will not take. I have never worn them in my life, we are always so used to Wanduchi. She hurried off and brought back her old kaftan of thin yellow material, and cut it up into two Wanduchi, while her husband, saying, And look, the poor fellow's footwear is almost worn out, brought me his new bashmarki, large ones which he wore over his top boots. Then he told me to go into the next room, which was empty, and change my shirt. I did so, and when I came back to them again they sat me down on a chair to put my new footwear on, he wrapping my feet and legs in the wanuchi, and she putting on the bashmarki. At first I would not let them, but they bade me sit down, saying sit down and be quiet, Christ washed his disciples' feet. There was nothing to do but obey, and I began to weep, and so did they. After this the lady went to bed with the children, and her husband and I went to a summer house in the garden. For a long while we did not go to sleep, but lay talking. He began in this way, Now in God's name and on your conscience tell me the real truth. Who are you? You must be of good birth, and are only assuming a disguise of simplicity. You read and write well, you speak correctly, and are able to discuss things, and these things do not go with a peasant upbringing. I spoke the real truth with a sincere heart both to you and to your wife when I told you about my birth, and I never had a thought of lying or of deceiving you. Why should I? As for the things I say, they are not my own, but what I have heard from my departed Sterets, who was full of divine wisdom, or what I have gathered from a careful reading of the Holy Fathers. But my ignorance has gained more light from interior prayer than from anything else, and that I have not reached by myself, it has been granted me by the mercy of God and the teaching of my Sterets. And that can be done by anyone. It costs nothing but the effort to sink down in silence into the depths of one's heart and call more and more upon the radiant name of Jesus. Everyone who does that feels at once the inward light, everything becomes understandable to him, he even catches sight in this light of some of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And what depth and light there is in the mystery of a man coming to know that he has this power to plumb the depths of his own being, to see himself from within, to find delight in self-knowledge, to take pity on himself and shed tears of gladness over his fall and his spoiled will. To show good sense in dealing with things and to talk with people is no hard matter and lies within anyone's power, for the mind and the heart were there before learning and human wisdom. If the mind is there, you can set it to work either upon science or upon experience, but if the mind is lacking then no teaching, however wise, and no training will be any good. The trouble is that we live far from ourselves and have but little wish to get any nearer to ourselves. Indeed we are running away all the time to avoid coming face to face with our real selves, and we barter the truth for trifles. We think, I would very gladly take an interest in spiritual things, and in prayer, but I have no time, the fuss and cares of life give no chance for such a thing. Yet which is really important and necessary, salvation and the eternal life of the soul, or the fleeting life of the body on which we spend so much labor. It is that that I spoke of, and that leads to either sense or stupidity in people. Forgive me, dear brother, 
I ask not just out of mere curiosity, but from friendliness and Christian sympathy, and even more because about two years ago I came across a case which gave rise to the question I put to you. It was like this, there came to our house a certain beggar with a discharged soldier's passport. He was old and feeble, and so poor that he was almost naked and barefoot. He spoke little, and in such a simple way that you would take him for a peasant of the steppes. We took him into the guest house, but some five days later he fell seriously ill, and so we moved him to this very summer house, where we kept him quiet, and my wife and I looked after him and nursed him. But after a while it was plain that he was nearing his end. We prepared him for it and sent for our priest for his confession, communion, and anointing. The day before he died, he got up and asked me for a sheet of paper and a pen and begged me to shut the door and to let no one in while he wrote his will, which he desired me to send after his death to his son at an address in Petersburg. I was astounded when I saw him write, for not only did he write a beautiful and absolutely cultured hand, but the composition also was excellent, thoroughly correct, and showing great delicacy of touch. In fact, I'll read you that will of his tomorrow. I have a copy of it, all this set me wondering, and aroused my curiosity enough to ask him about his origin and his life. After making me solemnly vow not to reveal it to anyone until after his death, he told me, for the glory of God, the story of his life. I was Prince X, he began. I was very wealthy and led a most luxurious and dissipated life. After the death of my wife, my son and I lived together, he being happily settled in military service, he was a captain in the guards. One day when I was getting ready to go to a ball at an important person's house, I was very angry with my valet. Unable to control my temper, I struck him a severe blow on the head and ordered him to be sent away to his village. This happened in the evening, and next morning the valet died from the effects of the blow. This did not affect me very seriously. I regretted my rashness but soon forgot the whole thing. Six weeks later, though, I began seeing the dead valet, in my dreams to begin with every night he disturbed me and reproached me, incessantly repeating, conscienceless man. You are my murderer. As time went on, I began seeing him when I was awake also, wide awake. His appearances grew more and more frequent with the lapse of time, till the agitation he caused me became almost constant. And in the end he did not appear alone, but I saw at the same time other dead men whom I had treated very badly, and women whom I had seduced. They all reproached me ceaselessly and gave me no peace, to such an extent that I could neither sleep nor eat nor do anything else. My strength grew utterly exhausted, and my skin stuck to my bones. All the efforts of skilled physicians were of no avail at all. I went abroad for a cure, but after trying it for six months, I was not benefited in the slightest degree, and those torturing apparitions grew steadily worse and worse. I was brought home again more dead than alive. I went through the horrors and tortures of hell in fullest measure. I had proof then that hell exists, and I knew what it meant. While I was in this wretched condition I recognized my own wrongdoing. I repented and made my confession. I gave all my serfs their freedom and took a vow to afflict myself for the rest of my days with as toilsome a life as possible, and to disguise myself as a beggar. I wanted, because of all my sins, to become the humblest servant of people of the very lowest station in life. No sooner had I resolutely come to this decision than those disturbing visions of mine ceased. I felt such comfort and happiness from having made my peace with God that I cannot adequately describe it. But just as I had been through hell before, so now I experienced paradise, and learned what that meant also, and how the kingdom of God is revealed in our hearts. I soon got perfectly well again and carried out my intention, leaving my native land secretly, furnished with a discharged soldier's passport. And now for the last fifteen years I have been wandering about the whole of Siberia. Sometimes I hire myself out to the peasants for such work as I can do. Sometimes I find sustenance by begging in the name of Christ. Ah, 
what blessedness and what happiness and what peace of mind I enjoy in the midst of all these privations. It can be felt to the full only by one who by the mercy of the great intercessor has been brought out of hell into paradise. When he came to the end of his story he handed me the will to forward to his son, and on the following day he died. And I have a copy of that will in a wallet lying on my Bible. If you would like to read it I will get it for you now. Here you are. I unfolded it, and read thus. In the name of God the glorious Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My dearest son. It is fifteen years now since you saw your father. But though you have had no news of him, he has from time to time found means to hear of you, and cherished a father's love for you. That love impels him to send you these few lines from his deathbed. May they be a lifelong lesson to you. You know how I suffered for my careless and thoughtless life, but you do not know how I have been blessed in my unknown pilgrimage and filled with joy in the fruits of repentance. I die at peace in the house of one who has been good to me, and to you also, for kindnesses showered upon the Father must touch the feeling heart of a grateful son. Render to him my gratitude in any way you can. In bestowing on you my paternal blessing, I adjure you to remember God and to guard your conscience. Be prudent, kindly, and considerate, treat your inferiors as benevolently and amiably as you can, do not despise beggars and pilgrims, remembering that only in beggary and pilgrimage did your dying father find rest and peace for his tormented soul. I invoke, God's blessing upon you, and calmly close my eyes in the hope of life eternal, through the mercy of the great intercessor for men, our Lord Jesus Christ. Your Father. Thus my host and I lay and chatted together, and, in my turn I put a question to him. I suppose you are not without worries and bothers, with this guest house of yours. Of course there are quite a lot of our pilgrim brotherhood who take to the life because they have nothing to do, or from sheer laziness, and sometimes they do a little thieving on the road, I have seen it myself. There have not been many cases of that sort, was the answer. We have for the most part always come across genuine pilgrims. And if we do get the other sort, we welcome them all the more kindly and try the harder to get them to stay with us. Through living with our good beggars and brothers in Christ they often become reformed characters and leave the guesthouse humble and kindly folk. Why, there was a case of that sort not so long ago. He was a man belonging to the lower middle class of our town here, and he went so thoroughly to the bad that it came to the point of everybody driving him away from their doors with a stick and refusing to give him even a crust of bread. He was a drunken, quarrelsome bully, and what is more he stole. That was the sort of person he was when one day he came to us, very hungry, and asked for some bread and wine, for the latter of which he was extraordinarily eager. We gave him a friendly reception and said, stay with us and we will give you as much wine as you like, but only on this condition, that when you have been drinking, you go straight away and lie down and go to sleep. If you get in the slightest degree unruly or troublesome, not only shall we turn you out and never take you back again, but I shall report the matter to the police and have you sent off to a penal settlement, as a suspected vagabond. He agreed to this and stopped with us. For a week or more he certainly did drink, I great deal, to his heart's content. But because of his promise and because of his attachment to the wine, which he was afraid of being deprived of, he always lay down to sleep afterward, or took himself off to the kitchen garden, and lay down there quietly enough. When he was sober again the brothers of the guest house talked persuasively to him and gave him good advice about learning to control himself, if only little by little to begin with. So he gradually began to drink less, and in the end, some three months later, he became quite a temperate person. He has taken a situation somewhere now, and no longer leads a futile life of dependence on other people's charity. The day before yesterday he came here to thank me. What wisdom! I thought, made perfect by the guidance of love. And aloud I said, Blessed be God, who has so shown his grace in the household under your care. After this talk we slept for an hour or an hour and a half till we heard the bells for matins. 
we got ready and went over to the church. On going in we at once saw the lady of the house, who had been there some time already with her children. We were all present at matins, and the divine liturgy went straight on afterward. The head of the house with his little boy and I took our places within the altar, while his wife and the little girl stood near the altar window, where they could see the elevation of the holy gifts. How earnestly they prayed as they knelt and shed tears of joy. And I wept to the full myself a eh, I looked at the light on their faces. After the service was over, the gentlefolk, the priest, the servants, and the beggars all went off together to the dining room. There were some forty or so beggars, and cripples and sick folk and children. They all sat down at one and the same table, and how peaceful and silent it all was. I plucked up my courage and said quietly to my host, they read the lives of the saints during meals in monasteries. You might do the same. You've got the whole series of books. Let us adopt the plan here, Mary, said he, turning to his wife, it will be most edifying. I will begin, and read at the first in a time, then you at the next, then the Batyushka, and after that the rest of the brothers who know how to read, in turn. The priest began to talk and eat at the same time. I like listening, but as for reading, well, with all respect I should like to be let off. You have no idea what a whirl I live in when I get home, worries and jobs of all sorts, first one thing has to be done and then another, what with a host of children and animals into the bargain my whole day is filled up with things to do. There's no time for reading or study. I've long ago forgotten even what I learned at the, the seminary. I shuddered as I heard this, but our hostess, who was sitting near me, took my hand and said, Vatyushka talks like that because he is so humble, he always makes little of himself, but he is really a man of most kindly and saintly life. He has been a widower for the last twenty years and is bringing up a whole family of grandchildren. For all that he holds services very frequently. At these words there came into my mind the following saying of Nicetas Stethatos in the Philokalia, the nature of things is judged by the inward disposition of the soul, that is, a man gets his ideas about his neighbors from what he himself is. And he goes on to say, he who has attained to true prayer and love has no sense of the differences between things, he does not distinguish the righteous man from the sinner, but loves them all equally and judges no man, as God causes his sun to shine and his rain to fall on the just and the unjust. We fell silent again. Opposite me sat one of the beggars from the guesthouse who was quite blind. The master of the house was looking after him. He cut up his fish for him, gave him his spoon, and poured out his soup. I watched carefully and saw that this beggar always had his mouth open and that his tongue was moving all the time, as though it were trembling. Surely, thought I, he must be one of those who pray. And I went on watching. Right at the end of dinner an old woman was taken ill. It was a sharp attack, and she began to groan. Our host and his wife took her into their bedroom and laid her on their bed, where the lady stayed to look after her. Her husband meanwhile ordered his carriage and went off at a gallop to the town for a doctor. The priest went to fetch the reserved sacrament, and we all went our ways. I felt as it were hungry for prayer, an urgent need to pour out my soul in prayer, and I had not been in quiet nor alone for forty-eight hours. I felt as though there were in my heart a sort of flood struggling to burst out and flow through all my limbs. To hold it back caused me severe, even if comforting, pain in the heart, a pain that needed to be calmed and satisfied in the silence of prayer. And now I saw why those who really practice interior self-acting prayer have fled from the company of men and hidden themselves in unknown places. I saw further why the venerable Isaiah the solitary called even the most spiritual and helpful talk mere idle chatter if there were too much of it, just as Ephraim the Syrian says, good speech is silver, but silence is pure gold. As I thought all this over, I made my way to the guest house, where everyone was resting after dinner. I went up into the attic, where I quietly rested and prayed. When the beggars were about again, 
I found the blind man and took him off to the kitchen garden, where we sat down alone and began to talk. Tell me, please, said I, do you for the sake of your soul say the prayer of Jesus? I have said it without stopping for a long while. But what sort of feeling do you get from it? Only this, that day or night I cannot live without the prayer. How did God show it you? Tell me about it, tell me everything, dear brother. Well, it was like this. I belong to this district and used to earn my living by doing tailoring jobs. I traveled about different provinces going from village to village, and made clothes for the peasants. I happened to stay a fairly long time in one village in the house of a peasant for whose family I was making clothing. One day, a holy day it was, I saw three books lying near the icons, and I asked who it was in the household that could read. No one, they answered, those books were left us by an uncle, he knew how to read and write. I picked up one of the books, opened it at random, and read, as I remember to this very hour, the following words. Ceaseless prayer is to call upon the name of God always, whether a man is conversing, or sitting down, or walking, or making something, or eating, whatever he may be doing, in all places and at all times, he ought to call upon God's name. Reading that started me thinking how simple that would be for me. I began to say the prayer in a whisper while I was sewing, and I liked it. People living in the same house with me noticed it, and began to make fun of me. Are you a wizard or what? They asked, going on whispering all the time. Or what are you muttering charms about? So to hide what I was doing, I gave up moving my lips and went on saying the prayer with my tongue only. In the end I got so used to the prayer that my tongue went on saying it by itself day and night, and I liked it. I went about like that for a long while, and then all of a sudden I became quite blind. Almost everyone in our family gets dark water in the eyes. So, because I was so poor, our people got me into the almshouse at Tobolsk, which is the capital of our province. I am on my way there now, only the gentry have kept me here, because they want to give me a cart as far as Tobolsk. What was the name of the book you read? Wasn't it called the Philokalia? Honestly, I don't know. I didn't even look at the title page. I fetched my Philokalia, and looked out in part four those very words of the patriarch Hylistus which he had said by heart, and I read them to him. Why, those are the very same words! cried the blind man. How splendid! Go on reading, brother. When I got to the lines, one ought to pray with the heart, he began to ply me with questions. What does that mean? How is that done? Comma? I told him that full teaching on praying with the heart was given in this same book, the Philokalia. He begged me eagerly to read the whole thing to him. This is what we will do, said I. When are you starting for Tobolsk? Straight away, he answered. Very well then, I am also going to take the road again tomorrow. We will go together and I will read it all to you, all about praying with the heart, and I will show you how to find where your heart is, and to enter it. And what about the cart? He asked. What does the cart matter? We know how far it is to Tobolsk, a mere hundred miles. We will take it easy, and think how nice it will be going along, just as two together alone, talking and reading about the prayer as we go. And so it was agreed. In the evening our host came himself to call us all to supper, and after the meal we told him that the blind man and I were taking the road together, and that we did not need a cart, so as to be able to read the Philokalia. More easily. Hearing this he said, I also liked the Philokalia very much and I have already written a letter and got the money ready to send to Petersburg when I go into court tomorrow, so as to get a copy sent me by return of post. So we set off on our way next morning, after thanking them very warmly for their great love and kindness. Both of them came with us for more than half a mile from their house. 
and so we bade each other goodbye. We went on, the blind man and I, by easy stages, doing from six to ten miles a day. All the rest of the time we spent sitting down in lonely places and reading the Philokalia. I read him the whole part about praying with the heart, in the order which my departed Steretz had shown me, that is, beginning with the writings of Nicephorus the monk, Gregory of Sinai, and so on. How eagerly and closely he listened to it all, and what happiness and joy it brought him. Then he began to put such questions to me about prayer as my mind was not equal to finding answers to. When we had read what we needed from the Philokalia, he eagerly begged me actually to show him the way the mind finds the heart, how to bring the divine name of Jesus Christ into it, and how to find the joy of praying inwardly with the heart. And I told him all about it thus, now you, as a blind man, can see nothing. Yet as a matter of fact you can imagine with your mind and picture to yourself what you have seen in time past, such as a man or some object or other, or one of your own limbs. For instance, can you not picture your hand or your foot as clearly as if you were looking at it? Can you not turn your eyes to it and fix them upon it, blind as they are? Yes, I can, he answered. Then picture to yourself your heart in just the same way, turn your eyes to it just as though you were looking at it through your breast, and picture it as clearly as you can. And with your ears listen closely to its beating, beat by beat. When you have got into the way of doing this, begin to fit the words of the prayer to the beats of the heart one after the other, looking at it all the time. Thus, with the first beat, say or think Lord, with the second, Jesus, with the third, Christ, with the fourth, have mercy, and with the fifth on me. And do it over and over again. This will come easily to you, for you already know the groundwork and the first part of praying with the heart. Afterward, when you have grown used to what I have just told you about, you must begin bringing the whole prayer of Jesus into and out of your heart in time with your breathing, as the fathers taught. Thus, as you draw your breath in, say, or imagine yourself saying, Lord Jesus Christ, and as you breathe again, have mercy on me. Do this as often and as much as you can, and in a short space of time you will feel a slight and not unpleasant pain in your heart followed by a warmth. Thus by God's help you will get the joy of self-acting inward prayer of the heart. But then, whatever you do, be on your guard against imagination and any sort of visions. Don't accept any of them whatever, for the Holy Fathers lay down most strongly that inward prayer should be kept free from visions, lest one fall into temptation. The blind man listened closely to all this and began eagerly to do with his heart what I had shown him, and he spent a long while at it, especially during the night time at our halting places. In about five days time he began to feel the warmth very much, as well as a happiness beyond words in his heart, and a great wish to devote himself unceasingly to this prayer, which stirred up in him a love of Jesus Christ. From time to time he saw a fight, though he could make out no objects in it. And sometimes, when he made the entrance into his heart, it seemed to him as though a flame, as of a lighted candle, blazed up strongly and happily in his heart, and rushing outward through his throat flooded him with light, and in the light of this flame he could see even far off things. This did indeed happen once. We were walking through a forest, and he was silent, wholly given up to the prayer. Suddenly he said to me, what a pity. The church is already on fire, there, the belfry has fallen. Stop this vain dreaming, I answered, it is a temptation to you. You must put all such fancies aside at once. How can you possibly see what is happening in the town? We are still seven or eight miles away from it. He obeyed me and went on with his prayer in silence. Toward evening we came to the town, and there as a matter of fact I saw several burnt houses and a fallen belfry, which had been built with ties of timber, and people crowding around and wondering how it was that the belfry had crushed no one in its fall. As I worked it out, the misfortune had happened at the very same time as the blind man spoke to me about it. And he began to talk to me on the matter. You told me, said he, that this vision of mine was vain, 
but here you see things really are as I saw them. How can I fail to thank and to love the Lord Jesus Christ, who shows His grace even to sinners and the blind and the foolish? And I thank you also for teaching me the work of the heart. Love Jesus Christ, said I, and thank Him all you will. But beware of taking your visions for direct revelations of grace. For these things may often happen quite naturally in the order of things. The human soul is not bound by place and matter. It can see even in the darkness, and what happens a long way off, as well as things near at hand. Only we do not give force and scope to this spiritual power. We crush it beneath the yoke of our gross bodies or get it mixed up with our haphazard thoughts and ideas. But when we concentrate within ourselves, when we draw away from everything around us and become more subtle and refined in mind, then the soul comes into its own and works to its fullest power. So what happened was natural enough. I have heard my departed starets say that there are people, even such as are not given to prayer, but who have this sort of power, or gain it during sickness, who see light even in the darkest of rooms, as though it streamed from every article in it, and see things by it, who see their doubles and enter into the thoughts of other people. But what does come directly from the grace of God in the case of the prayer of the heart is so full of sweetness and delight that no tongue can tell of it, nor can it be likened to anything material, it is beyond compare. Every feeling is base compared with the sweet knowledge of grace in the heart. My blind friend listened eagerly to this and became still more humble. The prayer grew more and more in his heart, and delighted him beyond words. I rejoiced at this with all my soul and thanked God from my heart that he had let me see so blessed a servant of his. We got to Tobolsk at last. I took him to the almshouse, and leaving him there with a loving farewell, I went on my own way. I went along without hurrying for about a month with a deep sense of the way in which good lives teach us and spur us on to copy them. I read the Philokalia a great deal, and there made sure of everything I had told the blind man of prayer. His example kindled in me zeal and thankfulness and love for God. The prayer of my heart gave me such consolation that I felt there was no happier person on earth than I, and I doubted if there could be greater and fuller happiness in the kingdom of heaven. Not only did I feel this in my own soul, but the whole outside world also seemed to me full of charm and delight. Everything drew me to love and thank God, people, trees, plants, and animals. I saw them all as my kinsfolk, I found on all of them the magic of the name of Jesus. Sometimes I felt as light as though I had no body and were floating happily through the air instead of walking. Sometimes when I withdrew into myself, I saw clearly all my internal organs and was filled with wonder at the wisdom with which the human body is made. Sometimes I felt as joyful as if I had been made Tsar. And at all such times of happiness, I wished that God would let death come to me quickly and let me pour out my heart in thankfulness at His feet in the world of spirits. It would seem that somehow I took too great a joy in these feelings, or perhaps it was just allowed by God's will, but for some time I felt a sort of quaking and fear in my heart. Was there, I wondered, some new misfortune or trouble coming upon me like what had happened after I met the girt again to whom I taught the prayer of Jesus in the chapel. A cloud of such thoughts came down upon me, and I remembered the words of the venerable John of Carpathus, who says that the Master will often submit to humiliation and endure disaster and temptation for the sake of those who have profited by him spiritually. I fought against the gloomy thoughts, and prayed with more earnestness than ever. The prayer quite put them to flight, and taking heart again I said, God's will be done, I am ready to suffer whatever Jesus Christ sends me for my wickedness and pride. And those to whom I had lately shown the secret of entry into the heart and interior prayer had even before their meeting with me been made ready by the direct and secret teaching of God. Calmed by these thoughts, I went on my way again filled with consolation, having the prayer with me and happier even than I had been before. It rained for a couple of days, and the road was so muddy that I could hardly drag my feet out of the mire. I was walking across the steppe, and in ten miles or so I did not find a sin's dwelling. 
At last toward nightfall I came upon one house standing by itself right on the road. Glad I was to see it, and I thought I would ask for a rest and a night's lodging here and see what God sent for the morrow, perhaps the weather would get better. As I drew near, I saw a tipsy old man in a soldier's cloak sitting on the Zavalina. I greeted him, saying, Could I perhaps ask someone to give me a night's lodging here? Who else could give it you but me? He shouted. I'm master here. This is a post house, and I am in charge of it. Then will you allow me, sir, to spend the night at your house? Have you got a passport? Give some legal account of yourself. I handed him my passport and, holding it in his hands, he again asked, Where is your passport? You have it in your hands, I answered. Well, come into the house, said he. He put his spectacles on, read the passport through, and said, All right, that's all in order. Stay the night. I'm a good fellow really. Have a drink? I don't drink, I answered, and never have. Well, please yourself, I don't care. At any rate have supper with us. They sat down to table, he and the cook, a young woman who also had been drinking rather freely, and asked me to sit down with them. They quarrelled all through supper, hurling reproaches at each other, and in the end came to blows. The man went off into the passage and to his bed in a lumber room, while the cook began to tidy up and wash up the cups and spoons, all the while going on with the abuse of her master. I took a seat, thinking it would be some time before she quieted down. So I asked her where I could sleep, for I was very tired from my journey. I will make you up a bed, she answered. And she placed another bench against the one under the front window, spread a felt blanket over them, and gave me a pillow. I lay down and shut my eyes as though asleep. For a long while yet the cook bustled about, but at last she tidied up, put out the fire, and was coming over toward me. Suddenly the whole window, which was in a corner at the front of the house frame, glass, and splinters of wood flew into shivers, which came showering down with a frightful crash. The whole house shook, and from outside the window came a sickening groan, and shouts and the noise of struggling. The woman sprang back in terror into the middle of the room and fell in a heap on the floor. I jumped up with my wits all astray, thinking the earth had opened under my feet. And the next thing I saw was two drivers carrying a man into the house so covered with blood that you could not even see his face. And this added still more to my horror. He was a king's messenger who had galloped here to change horses. His driver had not taken the turn into the gateway properly, the carriage pole stove in the window, and as there was a ditch in front of the house, the carriage overturned, and the king's messenger was thrown out, cutting his head badly on a sharp post. Five years, she answered. I was out of my mind when they brought me here, and it was here that God had mercy on me. The mother abbess kept me to wait on her in her cell and led me to take the veil. How came you to go out of your mind? I asked. It was fright, said she. I used to work at a post house, and late one night some horses stove in a window. I was so terrified that it drove me out of my mind. For a whole year my relations took me from one shrine to another, but it was only here that I got cured. When I heard this I rejoiced in spirit and praised God, who so wisely orders all things for the best. I had a great many other experiences, I said, speaking to my spiritual father, but I should want three whole days and nights to tell you everything as it happened. Still there is one other thing I will tell you about. One clear summer's day I noticed a cemetery near the road, and what they call a pogost, that is, a church with some houses for those who minister in it. The bells were ringing for the liturgy, and I made my way toward it. People who lived round about were going the same way, and some of them, before they got as far as the church, were sitting on the grass. Seeing me hurrying along, they said to me, Don't hurry, you'll have plenty of time for standing about when the service begins. Services take a long while here, 
our priest is in bad health and goes very slowly. The service did, in fact, last a very long while. The priest was a young man, but very thin and pale. He celebrated very slowly indeed, but with great devotion, and at the end of the liturgy he preached with much feeling a beautiful and simple sermon on how to grow in love for God. The priest asked me into his house and to stay to dinner. During the meal I said, How reverently and slowly you celebrate, Father. Yes, he answered, but my parishioners do not like it, and they grumble. Still, there's nothing to be done about it. I like to meditate on each prayer and rejoice in it before I say it aloud. Without that interior appreciation and feeling every word uttered is useless both to myself and to others. Everything centers in the interior life, and in attentive prayer. Yet how few concern themselves with the interior life, he went on. It is because they feel no desire to cherish the spiritual inward light. And how is one to reach that? I asked. It would seem to be very difficult. Not at all, was the reply. To attain spiritual enlightenment and become a man of recollected interior life, you should take some one text or other of Holy Scripture and for as long a period as possible concentrate on that alone all your power of attention and meditation, then the light of understanding will be revealed to you. You must proceed in the same way about prayer. If you want it to be pure, right, and enjoyable, you must choose some short prayer, consisting of few but forcible words, and repeat it frequently and for a long while. Then you will find delight in prayer. This teaching of the priest pleased me very much. How practical and simple it was, and yet at the same time how deep and how wise. I gave thanks to God, in my thoughts, for showing me such a true pastor of his church. When the meal was over, he said to me, You have a sleep after dinner while I read the Bible and prepare my sermon for tomorrow. So I went into the kitchen. There was no one there except a very old woman sitting crouched in a corner coughing. I sat down under a small window, took the philocalia out of my knapsack, and began to read quietly to myself. After a while I heard the old woman who was sitting in the corner ceaselessly whispering the prayer of Jesus. It gave me great joy to hear the Lord's most holy name spoken so often, and I said to her, What a good thing it is, Mother, that you are always saying the prayer. It is a most Christian and most wholesome action. Yes, she replied. The Lord have mercy is the only thing I have to lean on in my old age. Have you made a habit of this prayer for long? Since I was quite young, yes, and I couldn't live without it, for the Jesus prayer saved me from ruin and death. How? Please tell me about it, for the glory of God and in praise of the blessed power of the prayer of Jesus. I put the philocalia away in my knapsack and took a seat nearer to her, and she began her story. I used to be a young and pretty girl. My parents gave me in marriage, and the very day before the wedding, my bridegroom came to see us. Suddenly, before he had taken a dozen steps, he dropped down and died, without a single gasp. This frightened me so that I utterly refused to marry at all. I made up my mind to live unmarried, to go on a pilgrimage to the shrines and pray at them. However, I was afraid to travel all by myself, young as I was, I feared evil people might molest me. But an old woman pilgrim whom I knew taught me wherever my road took me always to say the Jesus prayer without stopping, and told me for certain that if I did, no misfortune of any sort could happen to me on my way. I proved the truth of this, for I walked even to far-off shrines and never came to any harm. My parents gave me the money for my journeys. As I grew old I lost my health, and now the priest here out of the kindness of his heart gives me board and lodging. I was overjoyed to hear this, and knew not how to thank God for this day, in which I had been taught so much by examples of spiritual life. Then, asking the kindly and devout priest for his blessing, I set off again on my way, rejoicing. Then again, not so long ago, as I was making my way here through the Kazan government, 
I had a chance of learning how the power of prayer in the name of Jesus Christ is shown clearly and strongly even in those who use it without a will to do so, and how saying the prayer often and for a long time is a sure and rapid way of gaining its blessed fruits. It happened that I was to pass the night at a Tatar village. On reaching it I saw a Russian carriage and coachman outside the window of one of the huts. The horses were being fed nearby. I was glad to see all this and made up my mind to ask for a night's lodging at the same place, thinking that I should at least spend the night with Christians. When I came up to them I asked the coachman where he was going, and he answered that his master was going from Kazan to the Crimea. While I was talking with the coachman, his master pulled open the carriage curtains from inside, looked out, and saw me. Then he said, I shall stay the night here, too, but I have not gone into the hut, Tata houses are so uncomfortable. I have decided to spend the night in the carriage. Then he got out, and as it was a fine evening, we strolled about for a while and talked. He asked me a lot of questions and talked about himself also, and this is what he told me. Until I was sixty-five I was a captain in the navy, but as I grew old I became the victim of gout, an incurable disease. So I retired from the service and lived, almost constantly ill, on a farm of my wife's in the Crimea. She was an impulsive woman of a volatile disposition, and a great card player. She found it boring living with a sick man and left me, going off to our daughter in Kazan, who happened to be married to a civil servant there. My wife laid hands on all she could, and even took the servants with her, leaving me with nobody but an eight-year-old boy, my godson. So I lived alone for about three years. The boy who served me was a sharp little fellow, and capable of doing all the household work. He did my room, heated the stove, cooked the gruel, and got the samovar ready. But at the same time he was extraordinarily mischievous and full of spirits. He was incessantly rushing about and banging and shouting and playing, and up to all sorts of tricks, so that he disturbed me exceedingly. And I, being ill and bored, liked to read spiritual books all the time. I had one splendid book by Gregory Palamas, On the Prayer of Jesus. I read it almost continuously, and I used to say the prayer to some extent. But the boy hindered me and no threats and no punishment restrained him from indulging in his pranks. At last I hit upon the following method. I made him sit on a bench in my room with me, and bade him say the prayer of Jesus without stopping. At first this was extraordinarily distasteful to him, and he tried all sorts of ways to avoid it and often fell silent. In order to make him do my bidding, I kept a cane beside me. When he said the prayer I quietly read my book, or listen to how he was saying it. But let him stop for a moment, and I showed him the cane, then he got frightened and took to the prayer again. I found this very peaceful, and quiet reigned in the house. After a while I noticed that now there was no need of the cane, the boy began to do my bidding quite willingly and eagerly. Further, I observed a complete change in his mischievous character, he became quiet and taciturn, and performed his household tasks better than before. I was glad of this and began to allow him more freedom. And what was the result? Well, in the end he got so accustomed to the prayer that he was saying it almost the whole time, whatever he was doing, and without any compulsion from me at all. When I asked him about it, he answered that he felt an insuperable desire to be saying the prayer always. And what are your feelings while doing so? I asked him. Nothing, said he, only I feel that it's nice to be saying it. How do you mean, nice? I don't know how to put it exactly. Makes you feel cheerful, do you mean? Yes, cheerful. He was twelve years old when the Crimean War broke out, and I went to stay with my daughter at Kazan, taking him with me. Here he lived in the kitchen with the other servants, and this bored him very much. He would come to me with complaints that the others, playing and joking among themselves, bothered him also, and laughed at him and so prevented him saying his prayer. In the end, after about three months, 
he came to me and said, I am going home. I'm unbearably sick of this place and all this noise. How can you go alone for such a distance and in winter, too? said I. Wait, and when I go I'll take you with me. Next day my boy had vanished. We sent everywhere to look for him, but nowhere could he be found. In the end I got a letter from the Crimea, from the people who were on our farm, saying that the boy had been found dead in my empty house on the 4th of April, which was Easter Monday. He was lying peacefully on the floor of my room with his hands folded on his breast, and in that same thin frock coat that he always went about my house in, and which he was wearing when he went away. And so they buried him in my garden. When I heard this news I was absolutely amazed. How had the child reached the farm so quickly? He started on the 26th of February, and he was found on the 4th of April. Even with God's help you want horses to cover 2,000 miles in a month. Why, it is nearly 70 miles a day. And in thin clothes, without a passport, and without a far thing in his pocket into the bargain, even supposing that someone may have given him a lift on the way, still that in itself would be a mark of God's special providence and care for him. That boy of mine, mark you, enjoyed the fruits of prayer, concluded this gentleman, and here am I, an old man, still not as far on as he. Later on I said to him, It is a splendid book, sir, the one by Gregory Palamas, which you said you liked reading. I know it. But it treats rather of the oral prayer of Jesus. You should read a book called the Philokalia. There you will find a full and complete study of how to reach the spiritual prayer of Jesus in the mind and heart also, and taste the sweet fruit of it. At the same time I showed him my Philokalia. I saw that he was pleased to have this advice of mine, and he promised that he would get a copy for himself. And in my own mind I dwelt upon the wonderful ways in which the power of God is shown in this prayer. What wisdom and teaching there was in the story I had just heard. The cane taught the prayer to the boy, and what is more, as a means of consolation it became a help to him. Are not our own sorrows and trials which we meet with on the road of prayer in the same way the rod in God's hand? Why then are we so frightened and troubled when our Heavenly Father in the fullness of His boundless love lets us see them, and when these rods teach us to be more earnest in learning to pray, and lead us on to consolation which is beyond words? When I came to the end of the things I had to tell, I said to my spiritual Father, Forgive me, in God's name. I have already chattered far too much. And the Holy Father's call even spiritual talk me a babble if it lasts too long. It is time I went to find my fellow traveller to Jerusalem. Pray for me, a miserable sinner, that of his great mercy God may bless my journey. With all my heart I wish it, dear brother in the Lord, he replied. May all the all-loving grace of God shed its light on your path, and go with you as the angel Raphael went with Tobias. Book 2 The Pilgrim Continues His Way The Starets A year had gone by since I last saw the pilgrim, when at length a gentle knock on the door and a pleading voice announced the arrival of that devout brother to the hearty welcome which awaited him. Come in, dear brother, let us thank God together for blessing your journey and bringing you back. The Pilgrim Praise and thanks be to the Father on high for his bounty in all things, which he orders as seems good to him, and always for the good of us pilgrims and strangers in a strange land. Here am I, a sinner, who left you last year, again by the mercy of God thought worthy to see and hear your joyful welcome. And of course you are waiting to hear from me a full account of the holy city of God, Jerusalem, for which my soul was longing and toward which my purpose was firmly set. But what we wish is not always carried out, and so it was in my case. And no wonder, for why should I, a wretched sinner, be thought fit to tread that holy ground on which the divine footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ were printed? You remember, Father, that I left here last year with a deaf old man as a companion, and that I had a letter from a merchant of Irkutsk to his son at Odessa asking him to send me to Jerusalem. Well, 
we got to Odessa all right in no very long time. My companion at once booked passage on a ship for Constantinople and set off. I for my part set about finding the merchant's son, by the address on the letter. I soon found his house, but there, to my surprise and sorrow, I learned that my benefactor was no longer alive. He had been dead and buried three weeks before, after a short illness. This made me very much cast down. But still, I trusted in the power of God. The whole household was in mourning, and the widow, who was left with three small children, was in such distress that she wept all the time and several times a day would collapse in grief. Her sorrow was so great that it seemed as though she too would not live long. All the same, in the midst of all this, she met me kindly, though in such a state of affairs she could not send me to Jerusalem. But she asked me to stay with her for a fortnight or so until her father-in-law came to Odessa, as he had promised, to settle the affairs of the bereaved family. So I stayed. A week passed, a month, then another. But instead of coming, the merchant wrote to say that his own affairs would not allow him to come, and advising that she should pay off the assistants and that all should go to him at Irkutsk at once. So a great bustle and fuss began, and as I saw they were no longer interested in me, I thanked them for their hospitality and said goodbye. Once more I set off wandering about Russia. I thought and thought. Where was I to go now? In the end I decided that first of all I would go to Kiev, where I had not been for many years. So I set off. Of course I fretted at first because I had not been able to carry out my wish to go to Jerusalem, but I reflected that even this had not happened without the providence of God, and I quieted myself with the hope that God, the lover of men, would take the will for the deed, and would not let my wretched journey be without edification and spiritual value. And so it turned out, for I came across the sort of people who showed me many things that I did not know, and for my salvation brought light to my dark soul. If that necessity had not sent me on this journey, I should not have met those spiritual benefactors of mine. So by day I walked along with the prayer, and in the evening when I halted for the night I read my Philokalia, for the strengthening and stimulating of my soul in its struggle with the unseen enemies of salvation. On the road about forty-five miles from Odessa I met with an astonishing thing. There was a long train of wagons loaded with goods, there were about thirty of them, and I overtook them. The foremost driver, being the leader, was walking beside his horse, and the others were walking in a group some way from him. The road led past a pond which had a stream running through it, and in which the broken ice of the spring season was whirling about and piling up on the edges with a horrible noise. All of a sudden the leading driver, a young man, stopped his horse, and the whole line of carts behind had to come to a standstill too. The other drivers came running up to him and saw that he had begun to undress. They asked him why he was undressing. He answered that he very much wanted to bathe in the pond. Some of the astonished, drivers began to laugh at him, others to scold him, calling him mad, and the eldest there, his own brother, tried to stop him, giving him a push to make him drive on. The other defended himself and had not the least wish to do as he was told. Several of the young drivers started getting water out of the pond in the buckets with which they watered the horses, and for a joke splashed it over the man who wanted to bathe, on his head, or from behind, saying, there you are, we'll give you a bath. As soon as the water touched his body, he cried out, ah, that's good, and sat down on the ground. They went on throwing water over him. Thereupon he soon lay down, and then and there quietly died. They were all in a great fright, having no idea why it had happened. The older ones bustled about, saying that the authorities ought to be told, while the rest came to the conclusion that it was his fate to meet this kind of death. I stayed with them about an hour and then went on my way. About three and a half miles farther on I saw a village on the high road, and as I came into it I met an old priest walking along the street. I thought I would tell him about what I had just seen and find out what he thought about it. The priest took me into his house, 
and I told him the story and asked him to explain to me the cause of what had taken place. I can tell you nothing about it, dear brother, except perhaps this, that there are many wonderful things in nature which our minds cannot understand. This, I think, is so ordered by God in order to show men the rule and providence, of God in nature more dearly, through certain cases of unnatural and direct changes in its laws. It happens that I myself was once a witness of a similar case. Near our village there is a very deep and steep-sided ravine, not very wide, but some seventy feet or more in depth. It is quite frightening to look down to the gloomy bottom of it. A sort of footbridge has been built over it. A peasant in my parish, a family man and very respectable, suddenly, for no reason, was taken with an irresistible desire to throw himself from this little bridge into that deep ravine. He fought against the idea and resisted the impulse for a whole week. In the end, he could hold himself back no longer. He got up early, rushed off, and jumped into the abyss. They soon heard his groans and with great difficulty pulled him out of the pit with his legs broken. When he was asked the reason for his fall, he answered that although he was now feeling a great deal of pain, yet he was calm in spirit, that he had carried out the irresistible desire which had worried him so for a whole week, and that he had been ready to risk his life to gratify his wish. He was a whole year in hospital getting better. I used to go to see him and often saw the doctors who were round him. Like you, I wanted to hear from them the cause of the affair. With one voice the doctors answered that it was frenzy. When I asked them for a scientific explanation of what that was, and what caused it to attack a man, I could get nothing more out of them, except that this was one of the secrets of nature which were not revealed to science. I for my part observed that if in such a mystery of nature a man were to turn to God in prayer, and also to tell good people about it, then this ungovernable frenzy of theirs would not attain its purpose. Truly there is much to be met with in human life of which we can have no clear understanding. While we were talking it was getting dark, and I stayed the night there. In the morning the mayor sent his secretary to ask the priest to bury the dead man in the cemetery, and to say that the doctors, after a post-mortem, had found no signs whatever of madness, and gave a sudden stroke as the cause of death. Look at that now, said the priest to me, Medical science can give no precise reason for his uncontrollable urge toward the water. And so I said goodbye to the priest and went on my way. After I had travelled for several days and was feeling rather done up, I came to a good-sized commercial town called Bielia Sekov. As evening was already coming on, I started to look around for a lodging for the night. In the market I came across a man who looked as though he were a traveller too. He was making inquiries among the shops, for the address of a certain person who lived in the place. When he saw me he came up to me and said, You look as though you are a pilgrim too, so let's go together and find a man by the name of Yevrainov who lives in this town. He is a good Christian and keeps a splendid inn, and he welcomes pilgrims. Look, I've got something written down about him. I gladly agreed, and so we soon found his house. Although the host himself was not at home, his wife, a nice old woman, received us very kindly and gave us an out-of-the-way private little garret in the attic to rest in. We settled down and rested for a while. Then our host came and asked us to have supper with them. During supper we talked, who we were and where we came from, and somehow or other the talk came round to the question of why he was called Yevrainov. I'll tell you an odd thing about that, he said, and began his story. You see, it was like this. My father was a Jew. He was born at Shklov, and he hated Christians. From his very earliest years, he was preparing to be a rabbi and studied hard at all the Jewish chit-chat which was meant to disprove Christianity. One day he happened to be going through a Christian cemetery. He saw a human skull, which must have been taken out of some grave that had been recently disturbed. It had both its jaws, and there were some horrible-looking teeth in them. In a fit of temper he began to jeer at this skull, he spat at it, abused it, and spurned it with his foot. Not content with that, 
he picked it up and stuck it on a post, as they stick up the bones of animals to drive off greedy birds. After amusing himself in this way, he went home. The following night he had scarcely fallen asleep when suddenly an unknown man appeared to him and violently upbraided him, saying, How dare you insult what is left of my poor bones? I am a Christian, but as for you, you are the enemy of Christ. The vision was repeated several times every night, and he got neither sleep nor rest. Then the same sight started flashing before his eyes during the daytime also, and he would hear the echo of that reproachful voice. As time went on, the vision got more frequent, and in the end he began to feel depressed and frightened and to lose strength. He went to his rabbi, who read prayers and exorcisms over him. But the apparition not only did not cease, it got even more frequent and threatening. This state of affairs became known, and, hearing about it, a business friend of his, a Christian, began to advise him to accept the Christian religion, and to urge upon him that apart from that there was no way of ridding himself of this disturbing apparition of his. But the Jew was loath to take this step. However, in reply he said, I would gladly do as you wish, if only I could be free from this tormenting and intolerable apparition. The Christian was glad to hear this, and persuaded him to send in to the local bishop a request for baptism and reception into the Christian church. The request was written, and the Jew, not very eagerly, signed it. And lo and behold, the very minute that the request was signed, the apparition came to an end and never troubled him again. His joy was unbounded, and entirely at rest in mind, he felt such a burning faith in Jesus Christ that he went straight away to the bishop, told him the, whole story, and expressed a heartfelt desire to be christened. He eagerly and quickly learned the dogmas of the Christian faith, and after his baptism he came to live in this town. Here he married my mother, a good Christian woman. He led a devout and very comfortable life, and he was most generous to the poor. He taught me to be the same and before his death gave me his instructions about this, together with his blessing. There you are, that's why my name is Yevrainov. I listened to this story with reverence and humility, and I thought to myself, how good and kind our Lord Jesus Christ is, and how great is his love. In what different ways he draws sinners to himself with what wisdom he uses things of little importance to lead on to great things. Who could have expected that the mischievous pranks of a Jew with some dead bones would bring him to the true knowledge of Jesus Christ and be the means of leading him to a devout life? After supper we thanked God and our host and retired to our garret. We did not want to go to bed yet, so we went on talking to each other. My companion told me that he was a merchant of Mogilyov, and that he had spent two years in Bessarabia as a novice in one of the monasteries there, but only with a passport that expired at a fixed date. He was now on his way home to get the consent of the merchant community to his finally entering upon the monastic life. The monasteries there satisfy me, their constitution and order, and the strict life of many devout Stasi who live there. He assured me that putting the Bessarabian monasteries beside the Russian was like comparing heaven with earth. He urged me to do the same. While we were talking about these things they brought still a third lodger into our room. This was a non-commissioned officer, with the army for the time being, but now going home on leave. We saw that he was tired out with his journey. We said our prayers together and lay down to steep. We were up early next morning, and began to get ready for the road, and we only just wanted to go and thank our host, when suddenly we heard the bells ringing for matins. The merchant, and I began to consider what we would do. How could we start after hearing the bells and without going to church? It would be better to stay to matins, say our prayers in church, and then we should go off more happily. So we decided, and we called the officer. But he said, what's the point of going to church while you are on a journey? What good is it to God if we have been? Let's get off home and then say our prayers. You two go if you want? I'm not going. By the time you have stood through matins I shall be three or four miles or so farther on my way, 
and I want to get home as quickly as possible. To this the merchant said, Look here, brother, don't you run so far ahead with your schemes until you know what God's plans are. So we went to church, and he took the road. We stayed through matins and the liturgy too. Then we went back to our garret to get our knapsacks ready for the start, when what do we see but our hostess bringing in the samovar. Where are you off to? She says. You must have a cup of tea, yes, and have dinner with us too. We can't send you away hungry. So we stayed. We had not been sitting at the samovar for half an hour, when all of a sudden our non-commissioned officer comes running in, all out of breath. I've come to you in both sorrow and joy. What's all this? We asked him. This is what he said. When I left you and started off, I thought I would look in at the pub to get change for a note, and have a drink at the same time so as to get along better. So I did. I got my change, had my drink, and was off like a bird. When I had gone about two miles I had a mind to count the money the fellow at the pub had given me. I sat down by the roadside, took out my pocket book, and went through it. All serene. Then suddenly it struck me that my passport was not there, only some papers and the money. I was as frightened as if I'd lost my head. I saw in a flash what had happened. Of course I had dropped it when I was settling up at the pub. I must run back. I ran and ran. Another awful idea seized me suppose it's not there. That will mean trouble. I rushed up to the man behind the bar and asked him. I've not seen it, he said. And was I downhearted. Well, I searched around and hunted everywhere, wherever I had stood and hung about. And what do you think? I was lucky enough to find my passport. There it was, still folded up and lying on the floor among the straw and litter, all trampled in the dirt, thank God. I was glad, I can tell you, it was as though a mountain had rolled off my shoulders. Of course it was filthy and coated with mud, enough to get me a clout on the head, still, it doesn't matter. At any rate I can get home, and back again with a whole skin. But I came to tell you about it. And what's more, in my fright I've rubbed my foot absolutely raw with running and I can't possibly walk. So I came to ask for some grease to bandage it up with. There you are, brother, the merchant began, that's because you wouldn't listen and come with us to church. You wanted to get a long way ahead of us, and, on the contrary, here you are back again, and lame into the bargain. I told you not to run so far ahead with your schemes, and now see how it has turned out. It was a small thing that you did not come to church, but besides that you used such language as, what good does it do God if we pray that, brother, was bad. Of course, God does not need our sinful prayers, but still, in his love for us he likes us to pray. And it is not only that holy prayer which the Holy Spirit himself helps us to offer and arouses in us that is pleasing to him, for he asks that of us when he says abide in me, and I in you, but every intention, every impulse, even every thought which is directed to his glory and our own salvation is of value in his sight. For all these the boundless loving kindness of God gives bountiful rewards. The love of God gives grace a thousandfold more than human actions deserve. If you give him the merest might, he will pay you back with gold. If you but purpose to go to the Father, he will come out to meet you. You say but a word, short and unfeeling receive me, have mercy on me and he falls on your neck and kisses you. That is what the love of the Heavenly Father is like toward us, unworthy as we are. And simply because of this love he rejoices in every gesture we make toward salvation, however small. It looks like this to you, what glory is there for God, what advantage for you, if you pray a little and then your thoughts wander again, or if you do some small good deed, such as reading a prayer, making five or ten acts of reverence, or giving a heartfelt sigh and calling upon the name of Jesus, or attending to some good thought, or setting yourself to some spiritual reading, or abstaining from some food, or bearing an affront in silence, 
all that seems to you not enough for your full salvation and a fruitless thing to do. No. None of these small acts is in vain, it will be taken into account by the all-seeing eye of God and receive a hundredfold reward, not only in eternity, but in this life. Street John Chrysostom asserts this. No good of any sort, he says, however trifling it may be, will be scorned by the righteous judge. If sins are searched out in such detail that we shall give an answer for words and desires and thoughts, then so much the more good deeds, however small they are, will be taken into account in all detail, and will be reckoned to our merit before our judge, who is full of love. I will tell you a case which I saw myself last year. In the Bessarabian monastery where I lived there was a Steretz, a monk of good life. One day a temptation beset him. He felt a great longing for some dried fish. And as it was impossible to get any in the monastery at that time, he was planning to go to the market and buy some. For a long while he struggled against the idea, and reasoned with himself that a monk ought to be content with the ordinary food provided for the brothers and by all means to avoid self-indulgence. Moreover, to walk about the market among crowds of people was also for a monk a source of temptation, and unseemly. In the end the lies of the enemy got the upper hand of his reasoning and he, yielding to his self-will, made up his mind and went for the fish. After he had left the building and was going along the street, he noticed that his rosary was not in his hand, and he began to think, how comes this, that I am going like a soldier without his sword? This is most unseemly. And lay folk who meet me will criticize me and fall into temptation, seeing a monk without his rosary. He was going back to get it, but, feeling in his pocket, he found it there. He pulled it out, crossed himself, and with his rosary in his hand went calmly on. As he got near the market he saw a horse, standing by a shop with a great cartload of enormous tubs. All at once this horse, taking fright at something or other, bolted with all its might and with thundering hoofs made straight for him, grazing his shoulder and throwing him to the ground, though not hurting him very much. Then, a couple of paces from him, that load toppled over and the cart was smashed to splinters. Getting up quickly, naturally he was frightened enough, but at the same time he marveled how God had saved his life, for if the load had fallen a split second earlier, then he would have been smashed to pieces like the cart. Thinking no further about it, he bought the fish, went back, ate it, said his prayers, and lay down to sleep. He slept lightly, and in his sleep a benign-looking Steretz whom he did not know appeared to him, and said, Listen, I am the protector of this dwelling, and I wish to teach you so that you will understand and remember the lesson now given you. Look now, the feeble effort you made against the feeling of pleasure, and your sloth in self-understanding and self-control, gave the enemy his chance to attack you. He had got ready for you that fatal bombshell which exploded before your eyes. But your guardian angel foresaw this and put into your mind the thought of offering a prayer and remembering your rosary. Since you listened to this suggestion, obeyed, and put it into action, it was just this that saved you from death. Do you see God's love for men, and his bountiful reward of even a slight turning toward him? Saying this, the visionary Steretz quickly left the cell. The monk bowed down at his feet, and in doing so woke up, to find himself, not on his bed, but kneeling prostrate at the threshold of the door. He told the story of this vision for the spiritual benefit of many people, myself among them. Truly boundless is the love of God for us sinners. Is it not marvelous that so small an action yes, just taking his rosary out of his pocket and carrying it in his hand and calling once upon the name of God should give a man his life, and that in the scales of judgment upon men one short moment of calling upon Jesus Christ should outweigh many hours of sloth. In truth, here is the repayment of the tiny mite with gold. Do you see, brother, how powerful prayer is and how mighty the name of Jesus when we call upon it? Street John of Carpathus in the Philokalia says that when in the prayer of Jesus we call upon the holy name and say, Have mercy on me, a sinner, then to every such petition the voice of God answers in secret, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. 
and he goes on to say that when we say the prayer there is at that moment nothing to distinguish us from the saints, confessors, and martyrs. For, as Street Chrysostom says, prayer, although we are full of sin when we utter I, immediately cleanses us. God's loving kindness to us is great, yet we sinners are listless, are not willing to give even one small hour to God in thanksgiving, and barter the time of prayer, which is more important than anything, for the bustle and cares of living, forgetting God and our duty. For that reason we often meet with misfortunes and calamities, yet even these the all-loving providence of God uses for our instruction and to turn our hearts to Him. When the merchant came to the end of his talk to the officer, I said to him, What comfort you have brought to my sinful soul too, your honour. I could bow down to your very feet. Hearing this, he began to speak to me. Ah, it seems you are a lover, of religious stories. Wait a moment and I'll read you another like the one I have just told him. I've got here a book I travel with called Agapia, or The Salvation of Sinners. There are a lot of wonderful things in it. He took the book out of his pocket and started reading a most beautiful story about one agathonic, a devout man who from his childhood had been taught by pious parents to say every single day before the icon of the Mother of God the prayer which begins Rejoice, God-bearing maiden. And this he always did. Later, when he had grown up and started life on his own, he got absorbed in, the cares and fuss of life and said the prayer but rarely, and finally gave it up altogether. One day he gave a pilgrim a lodging for the night, who told him he was a hermit from the Thebaid and that he had seen a vision in which he was told to go to Agathonic and rebuke him for having given up the prayer to the Mother of God. Agathonic said the reason was that he had said the prayer for many years without seeing any result whatever. Then the hermit said to him, Remember, blind and thankless one, how many times this prayer has helped you and saved you from disaster. Remember how in your youth you were wonderfully saved from drowning. Do you not recall that an epidemic of infectious disease carried off many of your friends to the grave, but you remained in health? Do you remember, when you were driving with a friend, you both fell out of the cart, he broke his leg, but you were unhurt? Do you not know that a young man of your acquaintance who used to be well and strong is now lying weak and ill, whereas you are in good health and feel no pain? And he reminded Agathonic of many other things. In the end he said, Know this, that all those troubles were warded off from you by the protection of the Most Holy Mother of God because of that short prayer, by which you lifted up your heart every day into union with God. Take care now, go on with it, and do not give up praising the Queen of Heaven lest she should forsake you. When he had finished reading, they called us to dinner, and afterward, feeling our strength renewed, we thanked our host and took the road. We parted, and each went his own way as seemed best to him. After that I walked on for about five days, cheered by the memory of the stories I had heard from the good merchant in Bielaya Serkov, and I began to get near to Kiev. All at once and for no reason at all I began to feel dull and heavy, and my thoughts got gloomy, and dispirited. The prayer went with difficulty and a sort of indolence came over me. So, seeing a wood with a thick undergrowth of bushes by the side of the road, I went into it to rest a bit, looking for some out-of-the-way place where I could sit under a bush and read my philocalia, and so arouse my feeble spirit and comfort my faint-heartedness. I found a quiet place and began to read Cassian the Roman in the fourth part of the philocalia on the eight thoughts. When I had been reading happily for about half an hour, Quite unexpectedly I noticed the figure of a man some hundred yards or so away from me and farther in the forest. He was kneeling quite motionless. I was glad to see this, for I gathered of course, that he was praying, and I began to read again. I went on reading for an hour or more and then glanced up again. The man was still kneeling there and never stirred. All this moved me very much and I thought, what devout servants of God there are. As I was turning it over in my mind, the man suddenly fell to the ground and lay still. This startled me, and as I had not seen his face, for he had been kneeling with his back to me, I felt curious to go and see who he was. When I got to him I found him in a light sleep. 
He was a country lad, a young fellow of about twenty-five. He had an attractive face, good-looking, but pale. He was dressed in a peasant's kaftan with a bast rope for a girdle. There was nothing else to note about him. He had no kotomka, not even a stick. The sound of my approach awoke him, and he got up. I asked him who he was, and he told me he was a state peasant of the Smolensk government, and that he was on his way from Kiev. And where are you going to now? I asked. I don't know myself where God will lead me, he answered. Is it long since you left home? Yes, over four years. And where have you been living all that time? I have been going from shrine to shrine and to monasteries and churches. There was no point in staying at home. I'm an orphan and I have no relations. Besides, I've got a lame foot. So I'm roaming about the wide world. Some God-fearing person, it seems, has taught you not just to roam anywhere, but to visit holy places, said I. Well, you see, he answered, having no father or mother, I used to go about as a boy with the shepherds of our village, and all went happily enough till I was ten years old. Then one day when I had brought the flock home I never noticed that the starster very best sheep was not among them. And our starster was a bad and inhuman peasant. When he came home that evening and found that his sheep was lost, he rushed at me abusing and threatening. If I didn't go off and find the sheep, he swore he'd beat me to death, and I'll break your arms and legs, he said. Knowing how cruel he was, I went after the sheep, searching the places where they had been feeding in daylight. I searched and searched for more than half the night, but there was not a trace of it anywhere. It was such a dark night, too, for it was getting on toward autumn. When I had got very deep into the forest, and in our government the forests are endless suddenly a storm came up. It was as though the trees were all rocking. In the distance, wolves started howling. Such a terror fell upon me that my hair stood on end. What's more, it all got more and more horrible, so that I was ready to drop with fear and horror. Then I fell on my knees and crossed myself, and with all my heart I said, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. As soon as I had said that I felt absolutely at peace, straight away, as if I had never been in any distress at all. All my fear left me, and I felt as happy in my heart as if I had flown away to heaven. This made me very glad, and well, I just didn't stop saying the prayer. To this day I don't know whether the storm lasted long and how the night went. I looked up and daylight was coming, and there was I still kneeling in the same place. I got up quietly, I saw I shouldn't find the sheep, and home I went. But all was well in my heart, and I was saying the prayer to my heart's content. As soon as I got to the village the starster saw I hadn't brought the sheep back and thrashed me till I was half dead he put this foot out of joint, you see. I was laid up, almost unable to move, for six weeks after that beating. All I knew was that I was saying the prayer and it comforted me. When I got a bit better I began to wander about in the world, and as to be continually jostling about in a crowd didn't interest me, and meant a good deal of sin, I took to roaming from one holy place to another, and in the forests too. That's how I have spent nearly five years now. When I heard this, my heart was very glad that God had thought me fit to meet so good a man, and I asked him, and do you often use the prayer now? I couldn't exist without it, he answered. Why? if I only just call to mind how I felt that first time in the forest, it's just as if someone pushed me down on my knees, and I begin to pray. I don't know whether my sinful prayer is pleasing to God or not. For as I pray, sometimes I feel a great happiness why, I don't know a lightness of spirit, a happy sort of quiet, but at other times I feel a dull heaviness and lowness of spirits. But for all that, want to go on praying always till I die. Don't be distressed, dear brother. Everything is pleasing to God and for our salvation everything, whatever it is that happens in time of prayer. So the Holy Fathers say. Whether it's lightness of heart or heaviness, 
it's all right. No prayer, good or bad, fails in God's sight. Lightness, warmth, and gladness show that God is rewarding and consoling us for the effort, while heaviness, darkness, and dryness mean that God is cleansing and strengthening the soul, and by this wholesome trial is saying it, preparing it in humility for the enjoyment of blessed happiness in the future. In proof of this I will read you something that Street John Climacus wrote. I found the passage, and read it to him. He heard it through with care and enjoyed it, and he thanked me very much for it. And so we parted. He went off right into the depth of the forest and I went back to the road. I went on my way, thanking God for treating me, sinner as I am, as fit to be given such teaching. Next day, by God's help, I came to Kiev. The first and chief thing I wanted was to fast a while and to make my confession and communion in that holy town. So I stopped near the saints as that would be easier for getting to church. A good old Cossack took me in, and as he lived alone in his hut, I found peace and quiet there. At the end of a week, in which I had been getting ready for my confession, the thought came to me that I would make it as detailed as I could. So I began to recall and go over all my sins from youth onward very fully, and so as not to forget it all I wrote down everything I could remember in the utmost detail. I covered a large sheet of paper with it. I heard that at Kitty via Pustina, about five miles from Kiev, there was a priest of ascetic life who was very wise and understanding. Whoever went to him for confession found an atmosphere of tender compassion and came away with teaching for his salvation and ease of spirit. I was very glad to hear of this, and I went to him at once. After I had asked his advice and we had talked a while, I gave him my sheet of paper to see. He read it through and then said, Dear friend, a lot of this that you have written is quite futile. Listen, first, don't bring into confession sins which you have already repented of and had forgiven. Don't go over them again, for that would be to doubt the power of the sacrament of penance. Next, don't call to mind other people who have been connected with your sins, judge yourself only. Thirdly, the Holy Fathers forbid us to mention all the circumstances of the sins, and tell us to acknowledge them in general, so as to avoid temptation both for ourselves and for the priest. Fourthly, you have come to repent and you are not repenting of the fact that you can't repent, that is, your penitence is lukewarm and careless. Fifthly, you have gone over all these details, but the most important thing you have overlooked, you have not disclosed the gravest sins of all. You have not acknowledged, nor written down, that you do not love God, that you hate your neighbor, that you do not believe in God's word, and that you are filled with pride and ambition. A whole mass of evil, and all our spiritual depravity is in these four sins. They are the chief roots out of which spring the shoots of all the sins into which we fall. I was very much surprised to hear this, and I said, Forgive me, Reverend Father, but how is it possible not to love God our Creator and Preserver? What is there to believe in if not the Word of God, in which everything is true and holy? I wish well to all my neighbors, and why should I hate them? I have nothing to be proud of, besides having numberless sins, I have nothing at all which is fit to be praised, and what should I with my poverty and ill health lust after? Of course, if I were an educated man, or rich, then no doubt I should be guilty of the things you spoke of. It's a pity, dear one, that you so little understood what I said. Look! It will teach you more quickly if I give you these notes. They are what I always use for my own confession. Read them through, and you will see clearly enough an exact proof of what I said to you just now. He gave me the notes, and I began to read them, as follows. A confession which leads the inward man to humility. Turning my eyes carefully upon myself and watching the course of my inward state, I have verified by experience that I do not love God, that I have no love for my neighbors, that I have no religious belief, and that I am filled with pride and sensuality. All this I actually find in myself as a result of detailed examination of my feelings and conduct, thus. I do not love God. 
For if I love God I should be continually thinking about Him with heartfelt joy. Every thought of God would give me gladness and delight. On the contrary, I much more often and much more eagerly think about earthly things, and thinking about God is labor and dryness. If I loved God, then talking with Him in prayer would be my nourishment and delight, and would draw me to unbroken communion with Him. But, on the contrary, I not only find no delight in prayer, but even find it an effort. I struggle with reluctance, I am enfeebled by sloth and am ready to occupy myself eagerly with any unimportant trifle, if only it shortens prayer and keeps me from it. My time slips away unnoticed in futile occupations, but when I am occupied with God, when I put myself into His presence, every hour seems like a year. If one person loves another, he thinks of him throughout the day without ceasing, he pictures him to himself, he cares for him, and in all circumstances his beloved friend is never out of his thoughts. But I, throughout the day, scarcely set aside even a single hour in which to sink deep down into meditation upon God, to inflame my heart with love of him, while I eagerly give up twenty-three hours as fervent offerings to the idols of my passions. I am forward in talk about frivolous matters and things which degrade the spirit, that gives me pleasure. But in the consideration of God I am dry, bored, and lazy. Even if I am unwillingly drawn by others into spiritual conversation, I try to shift the subject quickly to one which pleases my desires. I am tirelessly curious about novelties, about civic affairs and political events, I eagerly seek the satisfaction of my love of knowledge in science and art, and in ways of getting things I want to possess. But the study of the law of God, the knowledge of God and of religion, make little impression on me, and satisfy no hunger of my soul. I regard these things not only as a non-essential occupation for a Christian, but in a casual way as a sort of side issue with which I should perhaps occupy my spare time, at odd moments. To put it shortly, if love for God is recognized by the keeping of His commandments, if ye love me, keep my commandments, says our Lord Jesus Christ, and I not only do not keep them, but even make little attempt to do so, then in absolute truth the conclusion follows that I do not love God. That is what Basil the Great says, the proof that a man does not love God and his Christ lies in the fact that he does not keep his commandments. I do not love my neighbor either. For not only am I unable to make up my mind to lay down my life for his sake, but I do not even sacrifice my happiness, well-being, and peace for the good of my neighbor. If I did love him as myself, as the gospel bids, his misfortunes would distress me also, his happiness would bring delight to me too. But, on the contrary, I listen to curious, unhappy stories about my neighbor, and I am not distressed, I remain quite undisturbed or, what is still worse, I find a sort of pleasure in them. Bad conduct on the part of my brother I do not cover up with love, but proclaim abroad with censure. His well-being, honor, and happiness do not delight me as my own, and, as if they were something quite alien to me, give me no feeling of gladness. What is more, they subtly arouse in me feelings of envy or contempt. I have no religious belief neither in immortality nor in the gospel. If I were firmly persuaded and believed without doubt that beyond the grave lies eternal life and recompense for the deeds of this life, I should be continually thinking of this. The very idea of immortality would terrify me, and I should lead this life as a foreigner who gets ready to enter his native land. On the contrary, I do not even think about eternity, and I regard the end of this earthly life as the limit of my existence. The secret thought nestles within me, who knows what happens at death. If I say I believe in immortality, then I am speaking about my mind only, and my heart is far removed from a firm conviction about it. That is openly witnessed by my conduct and my constant care to satisfy the life of the senses. Were the Holy Gospel taken into my heart in faith, as the Word of God, I should be continually occupied with it, I should study it, find delight in it, and with deep devotion fix my attention upon it. Wisdom, mercy, and love are hidden in it, it would lead me to happiness, I should find gladness in the study of the law of God day and night. In it I should find nourishment like my daily bread, 
and my heart would be drawn to the keeping of its laws. Nothing on earth would be strong enough to turn me away from it. On the contrary, if now and again I read or hear the word of God, yet even so it is only from necessity or from a general love of knowledge, and approaching it without any very close attention I find it dull and uninteresting. I usually come to the end I of the reading without any profit, only too ready to change over to secular reading in which I take more pleasure and find new and interesting subjects. I am full of pride and sensual self-love. All my actions confirm this. Seeing something good in myself, I want to bring it into view, or to pride myself upon it before other people or inwardly to admire myself for it. Although I display an outward humility, yet I ascribe it all to my own strength and regard myself as superior to others, or at least no worse than they. If I notice a fault in myself, I try to excuse it, I cover it up by saying, I am made like that or I am not to blame. I get angry with those who do not treat me with respect and consider them unable to appreciate the value of people. I brag about my gifts, my failures in any undertaking I regard as a personal insult. I murmur, and I find pleasure in the unhappiness of my enemies. If I strive after anything good it is for the purpose of winning praise, or spiritual self-indulgence, or earthly consolation. In a word, I continually make an idol of myself and render it uninterrupted service, seeking in all things the pleasures of the senses and nourishment for my sensual passions and lusts. Going over all this I see myself as proud, adulterous, unbelieving, without love for God and hating my neighbor. What state could be more sinful? The condition of the spirits of darkness is better than mine. They, although they do not love God, hate men, and live upon pride, yet at least believe and tremble. But I! Can there be a doom more terrible than that which faces me, and what sentence of punishment will be more severe than that upon the careless and foolish life that I recognize in myself? On reading through this form of confession which the priest gave me I was horrified, and I thought to myself, good heavens! What frightful sins there are hidden within me, and up to now I've never noticed them. The desire to be cleansed from them made me beg this great spiritual father to teach me how to know the causes of all these evils and how to cure them. And he began to instruct me. You see, dear brother, the cause of not loving God is want of belief, want of belief is caused by lack of conviction, and the cause of that is failure to seek for holy and true knowledge, indifference to the light of the Spirit. In a word, if you don't believe, you can't love, if you are not convinced, you can't believe, and in order to reach conviction you must get a full and exact knowledge of the matter before you. By meditation, by the study of God's Word, and by noting your experience, you must arouse in your soul a thirst and a longing or, as some call it, wonder which brings you an insatiable desire to know things more closely and more fully, to go deeper into their nature. One spiritual writer speaks of it in this way, love, he says, usually grows with knowledge, and the greater the depth and extent of the knowledge the more love there will be, the more easily the heart will soften and lay itself open to the love of God, as it diligently gazes upon the very fullness and beauty of the divine nature and his unbounded love for men. So now you see that the cause of those sins which you read over is slothfulness in thinking about spiritual things, sloth which stifles the feeling of the need of such thought. If you want to know how to overcome this evil, strive after enlightenment of spirit by every means in your power, attain it by diligent study of the word of God and of the Holy Fathers, by the help of meditation and spiritual counsel, and by the conversation of those who are wise in Christ. Ah, dear brother, how much disaster we meet with just because we are lazy about seeking light for our souls through the word of truth. We do not study God's law day and night and we do not pray about it diligently and unceasingly. And because of this our inner man is hungry and cold, starved, so that it has no strength to take a bold step forward upon the road of righteousness and salvation. And so, beloved, let us resolve to make use of these methods, and as often as possible fill our minds with thoughts of heavenly things, and love, poured down into our hearts from on high, will burst into flame within us. We will do this together and pray as often as we can, 
for prayer is the chief and strongest means for our renewal and well-being. We will pray, in the words Holy Church teaches us, O God, make me fit to love Thee now, as I have loved sin in the past. I listened to all this with care. Deeply moved, I asked this Holy Father to hear my confession, and to give me communion. And so next morning after the honour of my communion, I was for going back to Kiev with this blessed viaticum. But this good father of mine, who was going to the Lavra for a couple of days, kept me for that time in his hermit's cell, so that in its silence I might give myself up to prayer without hindrance. And, in fact, I did spend both those days as though I were in heaven. By the prayers of my starets I, unworthy as I am, rejoiced in perfect peace. Prayer flowed out in my heart so easily and happily that during that time I think I forgot everything, and myself, in my mind was Jesus Christ and He alone. In the end, the priest came back, and I asked his guidance and advice where should I go now on my pilgrim way. He gave me his blessing with these words, You go to Pokhev, make your reverence there to the wonder-working of the most pure Mother of God, and she will guide your feet into the way of peace. And so, taking his advice in faith, three days later I set off for Pokhev. For some 130 miles or so I travelled none too happily, for the road lay through pothouses and Jewish villages and I seldom came across a Christian dwelling. At one farm I noticed a Russian Christian inn and I was glad to see it. I turned in at it to spend the night and also to ask for some bread for my journey, for my rusks were coming to an end. Here I saw the host, an old man with a well-to-do air and who, I learned, came from the same government that I did the Orlovsky. Directly I went into the room, his first question was, What religion are you? I replied that I was a Christian, and Pravoslavny Pravoslavny, indeed, said he with a laugh. You people are Pravoslavny only in word in act you are heathen. I know all about your religion, brother. A learned priest once tempted me and I tried it. I joined your church and stayed in it for six months. After that I came back to the ways of our society. To join your church is just a snare. The readers mumble the service all anyhow, with things missed out and things you can't understand. And the singing is no better than you hear in a pub. And the people stand all in a huddle, men and women all mixed up, they talk while the service is going on, turn round and stare about, walk to and fro, and give you no peace and quiet to say your prayers. What sort of worship do you call that? It's just a sin. Now, with us how live out the services, you can hear what's said, nothing is missed out, the singing is most moving, and the people stand quietly, the men by themselves, the women by themselves, and everybody knows what reverence to make and when, as Holy Church directs. Really and truly, when you come into a church of ours, you feel you have come to the worship of God, but in one of yours you can't imagine what you've come to to church or to market. From all this I saw that the old man was a die-hard rascalnik. But he spoke so plausibly, I could not argue with him nor convert him. I just thought to myself that it will be impossible to convert the old believers to the true church until church services are put right among us and until the clergy in particular set an example in this. The Raskolnik knows nothing of the inner life, he relies upon externals, and it is about them that we are careless. So I wanted to get away from here and had already gone out into the hall when to my surprise I saw through the open door of a private room a man who did not look like a Russian, he was lying on a bed and reading a book. He beckoned me and asked me who I was. I told him. And then he began, Listen, dear friend? Won't you agree to look after a sick man, say for a week, until by God's help I get better? I am a Greek, a monk from Mount Athos. I'm in Russia to collect arms for my monastery, and on my way back I've fallen ill, so that I can't walk for the pain in my legs. So I've taken this room here. Don't say no, servant of God. I'll pay you. There is no need whatever to pay me. I will very gladly look after you as best I can in the name of God. So I stayed with him. 
I heard a great deal from him about the things that concern the salvation of our souls. He told me about Atos, the holy mountain, about the great Podvaishniki there, and about the many hermits and anchorites. He had with him a copy of the Philokalia in Greek, and a book by Isaac the Syrian. We read together and compared the Slavonic translation by Pesy Velikovsky with the Greek original. He declared that it would be impossible to translate from Greek more accurately and faithfully than the Philokalia had been turned into Slavonic by Pesy. As I noticed that he was always in prayer and versed in the inward prayer of the heart, and as he spoke Russian perfectly, I questioned him on this matter. He readily told me a great deal about it, and I listened with care. I even wrote down many things that he said. Thus, for example, he taught me about the excellence and greatness of the Jesus prayer in this way, even the very form of the Jesus prayer, he said, shows what a great prayer it is. It is made up of two parts. In the first part, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, it leads our thoughts to the life of Jesus Christ, or, as the Holy Fathers put it, it is the whole Gospel. In brief. In the second part, Have mercy on me, a sinner, it faces us with the story of our own helplessness and sinfulness. And it is to be noted that the desire and petition of a poor, sinful, humble soul could not be put into words more wise, more clear-cut, more exact than these, Have mercy on me. No other form of words would be as satisfying and full as this. For instance, if one said, Forgive me, put away my sins, cleanse my transgressions, blot out my offenses, all that would express one petition only, asking to be set free from punishment, the fear of a faint-hearted and listless soul. But to say have mercy on me means not only the desire for pardon arising from fear, but is the sincere cry of filial love, which puts its hope in the mercy of God and humbly acknowledges it is too weak to break its own will and to keep a watchful guard over itself. It is a cry for mercy, that is, for grace which will show itself in the gift of strength from God, to enable us to resist temptation and overcome our sinful inclinations. It is like a penniless debtor asking his kindly creditor not only to forgive him the debt but also to pity his extreme poverty and to give him alms that is what these profound words have mercy on me express. It is like saying, Gracious Lord, forgive me my sins and help me to put myself right, arouse in my soul a strong impulse to follow thy bidding. Bestow thy grace in forgiving my actual sins and in turning my heedless mind, will, and heart to thee alone. Upon this I wondered at the wisdom of his words and thanked him for teaching my sinful soul, and he went on teaching me other wonderful things. If you like, said he, and I took him to be something of a scholar, for he said he had studied at the Athens Academy, I will go on and tell you about the tone in which the Jesus prayer is said. I happen to have heard many God-fearing Christian people say the oral Jesus prayer as the word of God bids them and according to the tradition of Holy Church. They use it so both in their private prayers and in church. If you listen carefully and as a friend to this quiet saying of the prayer, you can notice for your spiritual profit that the tone of the praying voice varies with different people. Thus, some stress the very first word of the prayer and say Lord Jesus Christ, and then finish all the other words on one level tone. Others begin the prayer in a level voice and throw the stress in the middle of the prayer, on the word Jesus as an exclamation, and the rest, again, they finish in an unstressed tone, as they began. Others, again, begin and go on with the prayer without stress until they come to the last words, have mercy on me, when they raise their voices in ecstasy. And some say the whole prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me a sinner, with all the stress upon the single phrase Son of God. Now listen. The prayer is one and the same. Orthodox Christians hold one and the same profession of faith. The knowledge is common to all of them that this sublime prayer of all prayers includes two things, the Lord Jesus and the appeal to Him. That is known to be the same for everybody. Why then do they not all express it in the same way, why not all in the same tone, that is? Why does the soul plead specially, and express itself with particular stress, not in one and the same place for all, but in a certain place for each? 
Many say of this that perhaps it is the result of habit, or of copying other people, or that it depends upon a way of understanding the words which corresponds with the individual point of view, or finally that it is just as it comes most easily and naturally to each person. But I think quite differently about it. I should like to look for something higher in it, something unknown not only to the listener, but even to the person who is praying also. May there not be here a hidden moving of the Holy Spirit making intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered in those who do not know how and about what to pray. And if everyone prays in the name of Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit, as the Apostle says, the Holy Spirit, who works in secret and gives a prayer to him who prays, may also bestow H's beneficent gift upon all, notwithstanding their lack of strength. To one he may give the reverent fear of God, to another love, to another firmness of faith, and to another gracious humility, and so on. If this be so, then he who has been given the gift of revering and praising the power of the Almighty will in his prayers stress with special feeling the word Lord, in which he feels the greatness and the might of the Creator of the world. He who has been given the secret outpouring of love in his heart is thrown into rapture and filled with gladness as he exclaims Jesus Christ, just as a certain steritz could not hear the name of Jesus without a peculiar flood of love. And gladness, even in ordinary conversation. The unshakable believer in the Godhead of Jesus Christ, of one substance with the Father, is enkindled with still more fervent faith as he says the words Son of God. One who has received the gift of humility and is deeply aware of his own weakness, with the words have mercy on me is penitent and humbled, and pours out his heart most richly in these last words of the Jesus prayer. He cherishes hope in the loving kindness of God and abhors his own falling into sin. There you have the causes in my opinion, of the differing tones in which people say the prayer in the name of Jesus. And from this you may note as you listen, to the glory of God and your own instruction, by what emotion anyone is specially moved, what spiritual gift any one person has. A number of people have said to me on this subject, why do not all these signs of hidden spiritual gifts appear together and united? Then not only one, but every word of the prayer would be imbued with one and the same tone of rapture. I have answered in this way. Since the grace of God distributes his gift in wisdom to every man severally according to his strength, as we see from Holy Scripture, who can search out with his finite mind and enter into the dispositions of grace. Is not the clay completely in the power of the potter, and is he not able to make one thing or another out of the clay? I spent five days with this steritz, and he began to get very much better in health. This time was of so much profit to me that I did not notice how quickly it went. For in that little room, in silent seclusion, we were concerned with nothing else whatever than silent prayer in the name of Jesus, or talk about the same subject, interior prayer. One day a pilgrim came to see us. He complained bitterly about the Jews and abused them. He had been going about their villages and had to put up with their unfriendliness and cheating. He was so bitter against them that he cursed them, even saying they were not fit to live because of their obstinacy and unbelief. Finally, he said that he had such an aversion for them that it was quite beyond his control. You have no right, friend, said the Steritz, to abuse and curse the Jews like this. God made them just as he made us. You should be sorry for them and pray for them, not curse them. Believe me, the disgust you feel for them comes from the fact that you are not grounded in the love of God and have no interior prayer as a security and, therefore, no inward peace. I will read you a passage from the Holy Fathers about this. Listen, this is what Mark the Podvishnik writes, the soul which is inwardly united to God becomes, in the greatness of its joy, like a good-natured, simple-hearted child, and now condemns no one, Greek, heathen, Jew, nor sinner, but looks at them all alike with sight that has been cleansed, finds joy in the whole world, and wants everybody, Greeks and Jews and heathen, to praise God. And Macarius the Great, of Egypt, says that the inward contemplative burns with so great a love that if it were possible he would have every one dwell within him, making no difference between bad and good. There, dear brother, you see what the Holy Fathers think about it. 
So I advise you to lay aside your fierceness, and look upon everything as under the all-knowing providence of God, and when you meet with vexations accuse yourself especially of lack of patience, and humility. At last more than a week went by and my stare at Scott well, and I thanked him from my heart for all the blessed instruction that he had given me, and we said goodbye. He set off for home and I started upon the way I had planned. Now I began to get near to Pokef. I had not gone more than seventy miles when a soldier overtook me, and I asked him where he was going. He told me he was going back to his native district in Kamenets Podolsk. We went along in silence for seven miles or so, and I noticed that he sighed very heavily as though something were distressing him, and he was very gloomy. I asked him why he was so sad. Good friend, if you have noticed my sorrow and will swear by all you hold sacred never to tell anybody, I will tell you all about myself, for I am near to death and I have no one to talk to about it. I assured him, as a Christian, that I had not the slightest need to tell anybody about it, and that out of brotherly love I should be glad to give him any advice that I could. Well, you see, he began, I was drafted as a soldier from the state peasants. After about five years service it became intolerably hard for me, in fact, they often flogged me for negligence and for drunkenness. I took it into my head to run away, and here I am a deserter for the last fifteen years. For six years I hid wherever I could. I stole from farms and larders and warehouses. I stole horses. I broke into shops and followed this sort of trade, always on my own. I got rid of my stolen goods in various ways. I drank the money, I led a depraved life, committed every sin. Only my soul didn't perish. I got on very well, but in the end I got into jail for wandering without a passport. But when a chance came I even escaped from there. Then unexpectedly I met with a soldier who had been discharged from the service, and was going home to a distant government. As he was ill and could hardly walk he asked me to take him to the nearest village where he could find lodging. So I took him. The police allowed us to spend the night in a barn on some hay, and there we lay down. When I woke up in the morning I glanced at my soldier and there he was dead and stiff. Well, I hurriedly searched for his passport, that is to say, his discharge, and when I found it and a fair amount of money too, while everybody was still asleep, I was out of that shed and the backyard as quickly as I could, and so into the forest, and off I went. On reading his passport I saw that in age and distinguishing marks he was almost the same as I. I was very glad about this and went on boldly into the depths of the Astrakhan government. There I began to steady down a bit and I got a job as a laborer. I joined up with an old man there who had his own house and was a cattle dealer. He lived alone with his daughter, who was a widow. When I had lived with him for a year I married this daughter of his. Then the old man died. We could not carry on the business. I started drinking again, and my wife too, and in a year we had got through everything the old man had left. And then my wife took ill and died. So I sold everything that was left, and the house, and I soon ran through the money. Now I had nothing to live on, nothing to eat, so I went back to my old trade of dealing in stolen goods, and all the more boldly now because I had a passport. So I took to my old evil life again for about a year. There came a time when for a long while I met with no success. I stole an old wretched horse from a bobble and I sold it to the knackers for a bob. Taking the money, I went off to a pub and began to drink. I had an idea of going to a village where there was a wedding, and while everybody was asleep after the feasting I meant to pick up whatever I could. As the sun had not yet set I went into the forest to wait for night. I lay down there and fell into a deep sleep. Then I had a dream and saw myself standing in a wide and beautiful meadow. Suddenly a terrible cloud began to rise in the sky, and then there came such a terrific clap of thunder that the ground trembled underneath me and it was as though someone drove me up to my shoulders into the ground, which jammed against me on all sides. 
Only my head and my hands were left outside. Then this terrible cloud seemed to come down onto the ground and out of it came my grandfather, who had been dead for twenty years. He was a very upright man and for thirty years was a church warden in our village. With an angry and threatening face he came up to me and I shook with fear. Round about nearby I saw several heaps of things which I had stolen at various times. I was still more frightened. My grandfather came up to me and, pointing to the first heap, said threateningly, What is that? Let him have it. And suddenly the ground on all sides of me began to squeeze me so hard that I could not bear the pain and the faintness. I groaned and cried out, Have mercy on me, but the torment went on. Then my grandfather pointed to another heap and said again, What is that? Crush him harder. And I felt such violent pain and agony that no torture on earth could compare with it. Finally, that grandfather of mine brought near me the horse that I had stolen the evening before, and cried out, And what is this? Let him have it as hard as you can. And I got such pain from all sides that I can't describe it, it was so cruel, terrible, and exhausting. It was as though all my sinews were being drawn out of me and I was suffocated by the frightful pain. I felt I could not bear it and that I should collapse unconscious if that torture went on even a little bit longer. But the horse kicked out and caught me on the cheek and cut it open, and the moment I got that blow I woke up in utter horror and shaking like a weakling. I saw that it was already daylight, the sun was rising. I touched my cheek and blood was flowing from it, and those parts of me which in my dream had been in the ground were all hard and stiff and I had pins and needles in them. I was in such terror that I could hardly get up and go home. My cheek hurt for a long time. Look, you can see the scar now. It wasn't there before. And so, after this, Fear and horror often used to come over me and now I only have to remember what I suffered in that dream for the agony and exhaustion to begin again, and such torture that I don't know what to do with myself. What is more, it began to come more often, and in the end I began to be afraid of people and to feel ashamed as though everybody knew my past dishonesty. Then I could neither eat nor drink nor sleep because of this suffering. I was worn to a ravel. I did think of going to my regiment and making a clean breast of everything. Perhaps God would forgive my sins if I took my punishment. But I was afraid, and I lost my courage because they would make me run the gauntlet. And so, losing patience, I wanted to hang myself. But the thought came to me that in any case I shan't live for a very long time, I shall soon die, for I have lost all my strength. And so I thought I would go and say goodbye to my home and die there. I have a nephew at home. And here I am on my way there for six months now. And all the while grief and fear make me miserable. What do you think, my friend? What am I to do? I really can't bear much more. When I heard all this I was astonished, and I praised the wisdom and the goodness of God, as I saw the different ways in which they are brought to sinners. So I said to him, Dear brother, during the time of that fear and agony you ought to have prayed to God. That is the great cure for all our troubles. Not on your life. He said, to me. I thought that directly as I began to pray, God would destroy me. Nonsense, brother, it is the devil puts thoughts like that into your head. There is no end to God's mercy and he is sorry for sinners and quickly forgives all who repent. Perhaps you don't know the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. You go on saying that without stopping. Why, of course I know that prayer. I used to say it sometimes to keep my courage up when I was going to do a robbery. Now, look here. God did not destroy you when you were on your way to do something wrong and said the prayer. Will he do so when you start praying on the path of repentance? Now, you see how your thoughts come from the devil. Believe me, dear brother, if you will say that prayer, taking no notice of whatever thoughts come into your mind, then you will quickly feel relief. 
all the fear and strain will go, and in the end you will be completely at peace. You will become a devout man, and all sinful passions will leave you. I assure you of this, for I have seen a great deal of it in my time. After that I told him about several cases in which the Jesus prayer had shown its wonderful power to work upon sinners. In the end I persuaded him to come with me to the Pokef Mother of God, the refuge of sinners, before he went home, and to make his confession and communion there. My soldier listened to all this attentively and, as I could see, with joy, and he agreed to everything. We went to Pokef together on this condition, that neither of us should speak to the other, but that we should say the Jesus prayer all the time. In this silence we walked for a whole day. Next day he told me that he felt much easier, and it was plain that his mind was calmer than before. On the third day we arrived at Pokef, and I urged him again not to break off the prayer either day or night while he was awake, and assured him that the most holy name of Jesus, which is unbearable to our spiritual foes, would be strong to save him. On this point I read to him from the Philokalia that although we ought to say the Jesus prayer at all times, it is especially needful to do so with the utmost care when we are preparing for communion. So he did, and then he made his confession and communion. Although from time to time the old thoughts still came over him, yet he easily drove them away with the Jesus prayer. On Sunday, so as to be up for matins more easily, he went to bed earlier and went on saying the Jesus prayer. I still sat in the corner and read my Philokalia by a rushlight. An hour went past, he fell asleep and I set myself to prayer. All of a sudden, about twenty minutes later, he gave a start and woke up, jumped quickly out of bed, ran over to me in tears, and, speaking with the greatest happiness, he said, Oh, brother, what I have just seen. How peaceful and happy I am, I believe that God has mercy upon sinners and does not torment them. Glory to Thee, O Lord, glory to Thee. I was surprised and glad and asked him to tell me exactly what had happened to him. Why, this he said. Directly I fell asleep I saw myself in that meadow where they tortured me. At first I was terrified, but I saw that, instead of a cloud, the bright sun was rising and a wonderful light was shining over the whole meadow. And I saw red flowers and grass in it. Then suddenly my grandfather came up to me, looking nicer than you ever saw, and he greeted me gently and kindly. And he said, Go to Jitoma, to the church of Street George. They will take you under church protection. Spend the rest of your life there and pray without ceasing. God will be gracious to you. When he said this he made the sign of the cross over me and straight away vanished. I can't tell you how happy I felt, it was as though a load had been taken off my shoulders and I had flown away to heaven. At that point I woke up, feeling easy in my mind and my heart so full of joy that I didn't know what to do. What ought I to do now? I shall start straight away for Jatorma, as my grandfather told me. I shall find it easy going with the prayer. But wait a minute, dear brother. How can you start off in the middle of the night? Stay for matins, say your prayers and then start off with God. So we didn't go to sleep after this conversation. We went to church, he stayed all through matins, praying earnestly with tears, and he said that he felt very peaceful and glad and that the Jesus prayer was going on happily. Then after the liturgy he made his communion, and when we had had some food I went with him as far as the Jitoma road, where we said goodbye with tears of gladness. After this I began to think about my own affairs. Where should I go now? In the end I decided that I would go back again to Kiev. The wise teaching of my priest there drew me that way, and, Besides if I stayed with him he might find some Christ-loving philanthropist who would put me on my way to Jerusalem or at least to Mount Athos. So I stopped another week at Pokef, spending the time in recalling all I had learned from those I had met on this journey and in making notes of a number of helpful things. Then I got ready for the journey, put on my kotomka, and went to church to commend my journey to the Mother of God. 
When the liturgy was over I said my prayers and was ready to start. I was standing at the back of the church when a man came in, not very richly dressed, but clearly one of the gentry, and he asked me where the candles were sold. I showed him. At the end of the liturgy I stayed praying at the shrine of the footprint. When I had finished my prayers I set off on my way. I had gone a little way along the street when I saw an open window in one of the houses at which a man sat reading a book. My way took me past that very window and I saw that the man sitting there was the same one who had asked me about the candles in church. As I went by I took off my hat, and when he saw me he beckoned me to come to him, and said, I suppose you must be a pilgrim. Yes, I answered. He asked me in and wanted to know who I was and where I was going. I told him all about myself and hid nothing. He gave me some tea and began to talk to me. Listen, my little pigeon, I should advise you to go to the Solovetsky Monastery. There is a very secluded and peaceful skeet there called Anzaski. It is like a second Atos and they welcome everybody there. The novitiate consists only in this, that they take turns to read the Psalter in church four hours out of the twenty-four. I am going there myself and I have taken a vow to go on foot. We might go together. I should be safer with you, they say it is a very lonely road. On the other hand, I have got money and I could supply you with food the whole way. And I should propose we went on these terms, that we walked half a dozen yards apart, then we should not be in each other's way, and as we went we could spend the time in reading all the while or in meditation. Think it over, brother, and do agree, it will be worth your while. When I heard this invitation I took this unexpected event as a sign for my journey from the Mother of God whom I had asked to teach me, the way to blessedness. And without further thought I agreed at once. And so we set out the next day. We walked for three days, as we had agreed, one behind the other. He read a book the whole time, a book which never left his hand day or night, and at times he was meditating about something. At last we came to a halt at a certain place for dinner. He ate his food with the book lying open in front of him and he was continually looking at it. I saw that the book was a copy of the Gospels, and I said to him, May I venture to ask, Sir, why you never allow the Gospels out of your hand day or night? Why you always hold it and carry it with you? Because, he answered, from it and it alone I am almost continually learning. And what are you learning? I went on. The Christian life, which is summed up in prayer. I consider that prayer is the most important and necessary means of salvation and the first duty of every Christian. Prayer is the first step in the devout life and also its crown, and that is why the Gospel bids unceasing prayer. To other acts of piety their own times are assigned, but in the matter of prayer there are no off times. Without prayer it is impossible to do any good and without the Gospel you cannot learn properly about prayer. Therefore, all those who have reached salvation by way of the interior life, the holy preachers of the Word of God, as well as hermits and recluses, and indeed all God-fearing Christians, were taught by their unfailing and constant occupation with the depths of God's Word and by reading the Gospel. Many of them had the Gospel constantly in their hands, and in their teaching about salvation gave the advice, sit down in the silence of your cell and read the Gospel and read it again. There you have the reason why I concern myself with the Gospel alone. I was very much pleased with this reasoning of his and with his eagerness for prayer. I went on to ask him from which Gospel in particular he got the teaching about prayer. From all four evangelists, he answered, in a word, from the whole of the New Testament, reading it. In order. I have been reading it for a long time and taking in the meaning, and it has shown me that there is a graduation and a regular chain of teaching about prayer in the Holy Gospels, beginning from the first evangelist and going right through in a regular order, in a system. For instance, at the very beginning there is laid down the approach, or the introduction to teaching about prayer, then the form or the outward expression of it in words. Farther on we have the necessary conditions upon which prayer may be offered, 
the means of learning it, and examples, and finally the secret teaching about interior and spiritual ceaseless prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, which is set forth as higher and more salutary than formal prayer. And then comes its necessity, its blessed fruit, and so on. In a word, there is to be found in the Gospel full and detailed knowledge about the practice of prayer, in systematic order or sequence from beginning to end. When I heard this I decided to ask him to show me all this in detail. So I said, as I like hearing and talking about prayer more than anything else, I should be very glad indeed to see this secret chain of teaching about prayer in all its details. For the love of God, then, show me all this in the Gospel itself. He readily agreed to this and said, Open your Gospel, look at it and make notes about what I say. And he gave me a pencil. Be so good as to look at these notes of mine. Now, said he, look out first of all in the Gospel of Street Matthew the sixth chapter, and read from the fifth to the ninth verses. You see that here we have the preparation or the introduction, teaching that not for vain glory and noisily, but in a solitary place and in quietude we should begin our prayer, and pray only for forgiveness of sins and for communion with God, and not devising many and unnecessary petitions about various worldly things as the heathen do. Then, read farther on in the same chapter, from the ninth to the fourteenth verses. Here the form of prayer is given to us that is to say, in what sort of words it ought to be expressed. There you have brought together in great wisdom everything that is necessary, and desirable for our life. After that, go on and read the fourteenth and fifteenth verses of the same chapter, and you will see the conditions it is necessary to observe so that prayer may be effective. For unless we forgive those who have injured us, God will not forgive our sins. Pass on now to the seventh chapter, and you will find in the seventh to the twelfth verses how to succeed in prayer, to be bold in hope ask, seek, knock. These strong expressions depict frequency in prayer and the urgency of practicing it, so t at prayer shall not only accompany all actions but even come before them in time. This constitutes the principal property of prayer. You will see an example of this in the 14th chapter of Street Mark and the 32nd to the 40th verses, where Jesus Christ himself repeats the same words of prayer frequently. Street Luke, chapter 11, verses 5 to 14, gives a similar example of repeated prayer in the parable of the friend at midnight, and the repeated request of the importunate widow, illustrating the command of Jesus Christ that we should pray always, at all times and in every place, and not grow discouraged, that is to say, not get lazy. After this detailed teaching we have shown to us in the Gospel of Street John the essential teaching about the secret interior prayer of the heart. In the first place we are shown it in the profound story of the conversation of Jesus Christ with the woman of Samaria, in which is revealed the interior worship of God in spirit, and in truth which God desires and which is unceasing true prayer, like living water flowing into eternal life. Farther on, in the fifteenth chapter, verses four to eight, there is pictured for us still more decidedly the power and the might, and the necessity of inward prayer that is to say, of the presence of the Spirit in Christ in unceasing remembrance of God. Finally, read verses 23 to 25 in the 16th chapter of the same Evangelist. See what a mystery is revealed here. You notice that prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, or what is known as the Jesus Prayer that is to say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, when frequently repeated, has the greatest power and very easily opens the heart and blesses it. This is to be noticed very clearly in the case of the Apostles, who had been for a whole year disciples of Jesus Christ, and had already been taught the Lord's Prayer by Him, that is to say, our Father, and it is through them that we know it. Yet at the end of His earthly life Jesus Christ revealed to them the mystery that was still lacking in their prayers. So that their prayer might make a definite step forward He said to them, Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name he will give it you. And so it happened in their case. For, ever after this time, when the Apostles learned to offer prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, how many wonderful works they performed and what abundant light was shed upon them. Now, 
Do you see the chain, the fullness of teaching about prayer deposited with such wisdom in the Holy Gospel? And if you go on after this to the reading of the Apostolic Epistles, in them also you can find the same successive teaching about prayer. To continue the notes I have already given you I will show you several places which illustrate the properties of prayer. Thus, in the Acts of the Apostles the practice of it is described that is to say, the diligent and constant exercise of prayer by the first Christians, who were enlightened by their faith in Jesus Christ. The fruits of prayer are told to us, or the results of being constantly in prayer that is to say, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and His gifts upon those who pray. You will see something similar to this in the 16th chapter, verses 25 and 26. Then follow it up in order in the Apostolic Epistles and you will see how necessary prayer is in all circumstances, how the Holy Spirit helps us to pray, how we ought all to pray in the Spirit, how necessary calm and inward peace are to prayer, how necessary it is to pray without ceasing, and finally we notice that one ought to pray not only for oneself but also for all men. Thus, by spending a long time with great care in drawing out the meaning we can find many more revelations still of secret knowledge hidden in the Word of God, which escape one if one reads it but rarely or hurriedly. Do you notice, after what I have now shown you, with what wisdom and how systematically the New Testament reveals the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ on this matter, which we have been tracing? In what a wonderful sequence it is put in all four evangelists! It is like this. In Street, Matthew we see the approach, the introduction to prayer, the actual form of prayer, conditions of it, and so on. Go farther. In Street Mark we find examples. In Street Luke, parables. In Street John, the secret exercise of inward prayer, although this is also found in all four evangelists, either briefly or at length. In the Acts the practice of prayer and the results of prayer are pictured for us, in the Apostolic Epistles, and in the Apocalypse itself, are many properties inseparably connected with the act of prayer. And there you have the reason that I am content with the Gospels alone as my teacher in all the ways of salvation. All the while he was showing me this and teaching me I marked in the Gospels, in my Bible, all the places which he pointed out to me. It seemed to me most remarkable and instructive, and I thanked him very much. Then we went on for another five days in silence. My fellow pilgrim's feet began to hurt him very much, no doubt because he was not used to continuous walking. So he hired a cart with a pair of horses and took me with him. And so we have come into your neighborhood and have stayed here for three days, so that when we have had some rest we can set off straight away to Anzuski, where he is so anxious to go. The Starets. This friend of yours is splendid. Judging from his piety he must be very well instructed. I should like to see him. The Pilgrim. We are stopping in the same place. Let me bring him to you tomorrow. It is late now. Goodbye. The Pilgrim. As I promised when I saw you yesterday, I have asked my revered fellow pilgrim, who solaced my pilgrim way with spiritual conversation and whom you wanted to see, to come here with me. The Starets. It will be very nice both for me and, I hope, also for these revered visitors of mine, to see you both and to have the advantage of hearing your experiences. I have with me here a venerable schema monk, and here a devout priest. And so, where two or three are gathered together in the name of Jesus Christ, there he promises to be himself. And now, here are five of us in his name, and so no doubt he will vouchsafe to bless us all the more bountifully. The story which your fellow pilgrim told me yesterday, dear brother, about your burning attachment to the Holy Gospel, is most notable and instructive. It would be interesting to know in what way this great and blessed secret was revealed to you. The Professor. The all-loving God, who desires that all men should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, revealed it to me of his great loving-kindness in a marvelous way, without any human intervention. For five years I was a professor and I led a gloomy dissipated sort of life, captivated by the vain philosophy of the world, and not according to Christ. 
Perhaps I should have perished altogether had I not been upheld to some extent by the fact that I lived with my very devout mother and my sister, who was a serious-minded young woman. One day, when I was taking a walk along the public boulevard, I met and made the acquaintance of an excellent young man who told me he was a Frenchman, a student who had not long ago arrived from Paris and was looking for a post as tutor. His high degree of culture delighted me very much, and he being a stranger in this country I asked him to my home and we became friends. In the course of two months he frequently came to see me. Sometimes we went for walks together and amused ourselves and went together into company which I leave you to suppose was very immoral. At length he came to me one day with an invitation to a place of that sort, and in order to persuade me more quickly he began to praise the particular liveliness and pleasantness of the company to which he was inviting me. After he had been speaking about it for a short while, suddenly he began to ask me to come with him out of my study where we were sitting and to sit in the drawing room. This seemed to me very odd. So I said that I had never before noticed any reluctance on his part to be in my study, and what, I asked, was the cause of it now, and I added that the drawing room was next door to the room where my mother and sister were, and for us to carry on this sort of conversation there would be unseemly. He pressed his point on various pretexts, and finally came out quite openly with this, among those books on your shelves there you have a copy of the Gospels. I have such a reverence for that book that in its presence I find a difficulty in talking about our disreputable affairs. Please take it away from here, then we can talk freely. In my frivolous way I smiled at his words. Taking the Gospels from the shelf I said, you ought to have told me that long ago, and handed it to him, saying, well, take it yourself and put it down somewhere in the room. No sooner had I touched him with the Gospels than at that instant he trembled, and disappeared. This dumbfounded me to such an extent that I fell senseless to the floor with fright. Hearing the noise, my household came running into me, and for a full half hour they were unable to bring me to my senses. In the end, when I came to myself again, I was frightened and shaky and I felt thoroughly upset, and my hands and my feet were absolutely numb so that I could not move them. When the doctor was called in, he diagnosed paralysis as the result of some great shock or fright. I was laid up for a whole year after this, and with the most careful medical attention from many doctors I did not get the smallest alleviation, so that as a result of my illness it looked as though I should have to resign my position. My mother, who was growing old, died during this period, and my sister was preparing to take the veil, and all this increased my illness all the more. I had but one consolation during this time of sickness, and that was reading the gospel, which from the beginning of my illness never left my hands. It was a sort of pledge of the marvelous thing that had happened to me. One day an unknown recluse came to see me. He was making a collection for his monastery. He spoke to me very persuasively and told me that I should not rely only upon medicines, which without the help of God were unable to bring me relief, and that I should pray to God and pray diligently about this very thing, for prayer is the most powerful means of healing all sicknesses both bodily and spiritual. How can I pray in such a position as this, when I have not the strength to make any sort of reverence, nor can I lift my hands to cross myself? I answered in my bewilderment. To this he said, well, at any rate, pray somehow. But farther he did not go, nor actually explain to me how to pray. When my visitor left me I seemed almost involuntarily to start thinking about prayer and about its power and its effects, calling to mind the instruction I had had in religious knowledge long ago, when I was still a student. This occupied me very happily and renewed in my mind my knowledge of religious matters, and it warmed my heart. At the same time I began to feel a certain relief in my attack of illness. Since the book of the Gospels was continually with me, such was my faith in it as the result of the miracle, and as I remembered also that the whole discourse upon prayer which I had heard in lectures was based upon the Gospel text, I considered that the best thing would be to make a study of prayer and Christian devotion solely upon the teaching of the Gospel. Working out its meaning, I drew upon it as from an abundant spring and found a complete system of the life of salvation and of true interior prayer. 
I reverently marked all the passages on this subject, and from that time I have been trying zealously to learn this divine teaching, and with all my might, though not without difficulty, to put it into practice. While I was occupied in this way, my health gradually improved, and in the end, as you see, I recovered completely. As I was still living alone I decided in thankfulness to God for His fatherly kindness, which had given me recovery of health and enlightenment of mind, to follow the example of my sister and the prompting of my own heart, and to dedicate myself to the solitary life, so that unhindered I might receive and make my own those sweet words of eternal life given me in the Word of God. So here I am at the present time, stealing off to the solitary skeet in the Solovetsky Monastery in the White Sea, which is called Anzaski, about which I have heard on good authority that it is a most suitable place for the contemplative life. Further, I will tell you this. The Holy Gospel gives me much consolation in this journey of mine, and sheds abundant light upon my untutored mind, and warms my chilly heart. Yet the fact is that in spite of all I frankly acknowledge my weakness, and I freely admit that the conditions of fulfilling the work of devotion and attaining salvation, the requirement of thoroughgoing self-denial, of extraordinary spiritual achievements, and of most profound humility which the Gospel enjoins, frighten me by their very magnitude and in view of the weak and damaged state of my heart. So that I stand now between despair and hope. I don't know what will happen to me in the future. The Schema Monk. With such an evident token of a special and miraculous mercy of God, and in view of your education, it would be unpardonable not only to give way to depression, but even to admit into your soul a shadow of doubt about God's protection and help. Do you know what the God-enlightened Chrysostom says about this? No one should be depressed, he teaches, and give the false impression that the precepts of the gospel, are impossible or impracticable. God who has predestined the salvation of man has, of course, not laid commandments upon him with the intention of making him an offender because of their impracticability. No, but so that by their holiness and the necessity of them for a virtuous life they may be a blessing to us, as in this life so in eternity. Of course the regular unswerving fulfillment of God's commandments is extraordinarily difficult for a fallen nature and, therefore, salvation is not easily attained, but that same word of God which lays down the commandments offers also the means not only for their ready fulfillment, but also comfort in the fulfilling of them. If this is hidden at first sight behind a veil of mystery, then that, of course, is in order to make us betake ourselves the more to humility, and to bring us more easily into union with God by indicating direct recourse to Him in prayer and petition for His fatherly help. It is there that the secret of salvation lies, and not in reliance upon one's own efforts. The Pilgrim. How I should like, weak and feeble as I am, to get to know that secret, so that I might to some extent, at least, put my slothful life right, for the glory of God and my own salvation. The Schema Monk. The secret is known to you, dear brother, from your book The Philokalia. It lies in that unceasing prayer of which you have made so resolute a study and in which you have so zealously occupied yourself and found comfort. The Pilgrim. I fall at your feet, Reverend Father. For the love of God let me hear something for my good from your lips about this saving mystery and about holy prayer, which I long to hear about more than anything else and about which I love reading to get strength and comfort for my very sinful soul. The Schema Monk. I cannot satisfy your wish with my own thoughts on this exalted subject, because I have had but very little experience of it myself. But I have some very clearly written notes by a spiritual writer precisely on this subject. If the rest of those who are talking with us would like it, I will get it at once and with your permission I can read it to you all all. Do be so kind, Reverend Father. Do not keep such saving knowledge from us.